This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, a big hello to Central Elementary in Virginia, Henry B. Birkeland in Massachusetts, and Mount Horeb in New Jersey. A huge welcome to all you guys and your schools and your teachers. It's very exciting to have you on a live safari. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have my good friend, Vim whose nickname is the Wildebeest, and that's what we're looking at here. Uh, we're looking at a herd of blue Wildebeest, and uh, it is a very, very windy weather today, which makes a lot of the animals a little bit nervous, because animals like lions and leopards might be able to sneak up on them without them hearing them coming. So the wildebeest are grazers, which means they eat grass. Oh, Mackenzie would like to know how many animals are there in the reserve. Mackenzie, a lot. Uh, there's probably a couple of thousand wildebeest. There's about a hundred, over a hundred lions, uh, probably close on a hundred leopard, uh, and about fifty or sixty wild dogs. Uh, 10 plus thousand impala and inyala so lots and lots of animals and you must remember that this is there's no fence between us and the other reserves so these animals have eight million acres that they can disappear into so even though we only stay in a small area uh, the animals can go wherever they want now i'm going to look for my favorite animal today and it is called the african wild dog and uh, they will eat baby wildebeest, and Alan, a baby wildebeest is called a wildebeest calf. So it's a calf, a big male wildebeest is called a wildebeest bull, and a female is called a wildebeest cow. Okay, should we go see what we can find? I saw some wild dogs earlier today, at around lunchtime, down in the south of the reserve. So I'm going to hopefully try and catch up with them, but they move very quickly, so they can be quite difficult to find. So hopefully we've got some luck. Now, of course, I'm not the only one taking you guys on a safari. We've got two other people out there, and we're going to introduce you now to James, who's walking through the African bush. It's very windy out here today, kids. Very difficult to stay upright. If I don't lean forward, I get blown backwards. Now, this is very unusual weather for this part of the world. My name is James, and on camera today is Sebastian. He is from another African country called Gabon, which is a long way from here. We're also accompanied, of course, by a fellow called David, who's from Kenya. So you are accompanied by three different kinds of African here today, which is very exciting. In fact, four. Also, we have Rexon, who is like me from South Africa. Now, if you have any questions, you must please remember to ask anything at all you like. I will do my best to answer your questions. You ask your teacher, and she will ask me. And I believe that some of you are doing library class today. I'm not sure how we're going to help with your understanding of books, but we will definitely do our best to help your understanding of the wilderness. Matthew, I'm afraid because of this wind, I missed your question. Let's have it again. Ah, now... <laughs> Matthew, you're obviously somebody who has got a good handle on geography, either that or your teacher has, and you say, how remote is this area from most other areas or from other areas in southern, southern Africa? Well, it, the nearest town, the best, the best way to describe it, the nearest town is about an hour and 20 minutes drive away, the nearest big town, but the nearest village, tiny little village called Dixie Village, is not too far from here. It's probably only about say five miles from where we're sitting now, so that's not too far. So I suppose that's the best way to describe how remote we are, but if we point that way, which is to the east, 
you won't find a village for a good hundred kilometers or so which is about 60 miles possibly even more than that and that way the nearest big town is probably more than three or four hundred kilometers away about 250 miles as the crow flies no crow is going to be flying in this weather I'll tell you that for free it is very very windy and so because it's so windy we on foot are going to walk around here in very uh, or in the open areas we're not going to go into the thick bush where we can't hear what's going on let's go across now to a bird probably holding on very tightly to its branch Hello everybody and welcome aboard the Sunset Safari. We're looking here at a little fork-tailed drongo birdie and uh, well you're watching Safari Live and my name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera we have Darby. Now please don't forget little kiddies from the Central Elementary Henry B and Mount Horeb schools. Uh, please send your questions through your teacher and ask us all your little questions and your comments because we'd love for you to join Join us out here in the African bush in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. Now I know if I speak a little bit strangely to you it's because I'm South African and uh, here in South Africa we do speak English not American um, and I know that my little boy his name is Kai he's also six years old and he says that you Americans talk, talk strangely but um, uh, I think that we talk a little bit strangely don't we but anyway nonetheless we're going to be going and looking for all sorts of animals this afternoon uh, I think I'm going to try and find some leopards but it's very windy and I'm sure the other guides have told you that it's also quite cool now but it's a very good time for us to find those animals that like to eat other animals like leopard and lions so let's go look for them why don't we and as we drive along you can see the grass and the trees moving in the wind Now, Parker and Neva, uh, we, you have to have more predators or carnivores than you do have uh, herbivores because they eat the herbivores. So remember, it's like a triangle. I'm just going to stop so I can show you. It's a triangle. Right up at the top is the predators and as you go down the triangle it gets more and more animals right down to the bottom of the triangle because there needs to be the most animals at the bottom and at the bottom we also talk about the grass and the trees and all of that so at the bottom lots of trees lots of grass what eats grass and trees the herbivores what eats herbivores the carnivores like the leopards and lions that we're looking for so let's go on and look for some of them and when we're looking for them we sometimes look on the road for the little tracks and all sorts of things like that and somebody that's very good with tracks and out on foot is James let's go see what he's been able to find <laughs> we're just now sitting I think with the very same animals that you saw first they are wildebeest or gnus and you saw them with Brent earlier and you know normally if they th heard me talking this loudly near where they are and they s looked up and saw us walking on foot they'd run away but because the wind is blowing so hard I don't think that they can hear my voice and so they haven't looked up which means they haven't seen us now what's interesting about that of course is that it means it's much easier for predators to catch them on a windy day like this I'm afraid I missed the name and the wind is it Adelaide? Advic. 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 That's an interesting name. Advic. You're wondering how you tell the difference between a male and a female wildebeest? Well, let's try and sneak a bit closer and I'll show you. The males are larger than the females in general, but it's difficult to tell at this distance. Then the only other way to do it, I'm afraid, is to look at the private parts. And in a female, you can see behind the tail. And on a male, you can also see behind the tail or under the belly. Now, let's see if they spot us.
<laughs> now we're not very close to these animals. We're probably about a hundred meters away, which is about a hundred yards or three hundred feet. And Carrington, we can get this close because they see us as a predator. They do not see us as something that they want to eat, obviously, these are grazers. But also, because they see us as a predator, their first reaction is to move away from us, not to come towards us. And even if there were lions there, they would probably move away. An animal only becomes dangerous when it is cornered, and that means when it cannot move away, and when it feels like you are threatening it and it cannot run from you. Then they will come towards you and then it becomes a lot more dangerous. But in this instance, if we look at these wildebeest and the impala around them, you can see there's plenty of space for them to go lots of areas. And so all they will do if they become afraid of us is move away. They will increase the distance between us and them. I also look a lot closer than I am because of the angle that the camera is at. Aiden, <laughs> wildebeest do not lay eggs. No, Aiden, wildebeest are mammals, which means they give birth to live young. Okay, so like you're a mammal, and a cat and a dog is a mammal, and a cow is a mammal, so a wildebeest is a mammal, and that means that they give birth to live young, in the same way that you were never an egg, well, I suppose half of you was an egg, but you don't need to worry about that, but you weren't born as an egg. So is the same for wildebeest. The animals that lay eggs, or the big animals that lay eggs, would be fish. They lay eggs most of the time. Reptiles, like snakes and lizards, they lay eggs most of the time. Birds lay eggs, of course, like chickens, and you eat chicken eggs sometimes. And frogs and toads and salamanders, they will also lay eggs. Also, insects and arachnids, like ticks and spiders, they also lay eggs. But mammals, and this is one of the very special things about mammals, like us, and like these wildebeest and the impala is that we give birth to live young. That's one of the main features of being a mammal. I believe, I believe that Ralph has got another bird gripping onto a branch trying not to fly off. Yes, and these little creatures, these, they lay eggs, don't they? Little birds. And these ones are like your cockatiels that maybe some of you have as pets. But these are very wild and free. And uh, these are called grey go-away birds. Why are they called that? Because their call is like, Go away! Go away! Go away! So hopefully we'll hear them call, but for the minute they're just jumping around this very thorny tree. And they've got very thick bills on them, and that means that they eat fruit. And what they're doing is they're jumping around this tree, trying to hang on in the wind, and they're looking for the little fruits that are uh, available on the tree now. So if we get lucky, we might see them actually eating the little fruits. There was one eating it just now. Dylan, these little animals and all the other animals around here, they need to go and get their own water from the little pans and ponds that are around here in the game reserve. So there's always water somewhere, but they need to know where to get it. And a lot of them can smell the water, and they've got very good sense of smell, and that means that they are able to sniff the air and they can smell where the water is, and then they walk in that direction and they find the water. If you're a bird, you can see the water from up in the sky. Now, there's a bird that is like Zazu from the Lion King. That is a hornbill, but it's a red-billed hornbill. Zazu was a yellow-billed hornbill, so he's just a little bit different. And what is he going for? Oh, there's a little insect he's going for. There's a little bug. Is he going to eat it? Those hornbills like to eat insects. They can eat insects and fruit and seeds and all sorts, but it looks like he's spotted a yellow and black beetle. And I wonder if he wants to eat it. It looks like a bit of a stink bug. I don't think it's going to taste very nice. Now, 
Kellen, the most poisonous plants out here are the ones that are like cactus. And they've got a white uh, liquid inside that uh, can burn your eyes. And if you've got a little cut and you get some of that liquid on it, it's also going to burn very much. And there's also some trees that have, if you pull a leaf off of that tree, it's got a milky latex on the inside. And uh, if you make a fire with that wood and you cook your meat on it or anything on top of that, it's going to give you a, a runny tummy. So those are the most poisonous plants that we have. But the most poisonous poisonous animals are the little insects and things like these birds are trying to eat up here so they need to be careful they can't just eat any little insect that they find they need to watch out because some of them are poisonous too and when we think of scorpions and snakes they aren't poisonous are they they are venomous because they inject uh, the, the venom inside you so uh, a scorpion and a snake is venomous and a tree and an insect are poisonous so that's very interesting to remember remember that kiddies now I think these birds have really struggled to hold on to that tree I think some of them have actually flown off oh no there is there is one or two there still. Abigail, um, the grey go-away bird, he will put his head down into the water, but he'll only put his bill in the water and suck up some water and then put his head back like a duck does and swallow the water down. But he doesn't put his whole head in the water. There is a very special bird that goes to the water called a sand grouse and he uh, soaks his feathers in the water and then flies back to the nest and the little babies that are in the nest they will drink the water from the daddy's feathers. Very special isn't it? But these little birds I think they they're just trying to stay inside this tree and not get blown away. Okay everyone. Ooh. What's he doing now? I think he's still just trying to stay on the branch in the wind. Okay, I think we're going to carry on and look for some lions and leopards. And um, I know someone who's also looking for something very exciting, and that's Brent. Let's go over to him. Well, I can't find any sign of the dogs just yet. They were around this area. So it's been quite cool today. So they might have kept moving so I'm going to keep slowly moving towards the east and if we don't find any dogs we maybe we can find you something else like elephants or hippos now Angelina and Ethan I'm not sure where you are uh, in the, the, the states are you in Massachusetts oh in Virginia well, you'd have to get to Atlanta first, and then I think from Atlanta, it's a 13 or 14 hour direct flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg. And then once you land in Johannesburg, then you would have to fly for another hour and a, a little bit to get from Johannesburg to where we are. So a long time, in other words. Oh, another excellent question from Madeline and Maxwell. How far are we from the equator uh, in the reserve? We are quite far, probably just, um, shall I work it out? Probably around a thousand miles or so, uh, maybe a little bit more. I'll have to double check, but uh, somewhere between a thousand and two thousand miles from the equator. Guys, give me tough questions. I like it. I like it. Good questions. Sophia, yes, quite a lot of the other animals will live in other parts of Africa as well. Uh, lions, leopards cheetah, wild dog, impala, kudu, but then we've got some animals that only live in a very small area like the Nyara, only live in South Africa and Mozambique which is next door to us 
and uh, so it depends certain animals yes occur over lots of different places uh, other animals occur only in within quite a small area okay let's have a look now this is where I think the wild dogs could have gone there's a water hole up ahead so they might have gone for a drink Very windy. Nearly lost my hat there. Phelan, how we spot animals when they're so camouflaged is we use our eyes and we train our eyes. So the more time you spend out in the bush looking for things, you learn how to spot little things that look slightly out of place. So that's how we, we train our eyes by using them every day to look for all the difficult things to spot. Now the other way we find animals failing is I look for their footprints in the sand and then I'll follow their footprints and then we sometimes that's how we find animals by following their footprints. But so far, I've found no footprints to follow. Hopefully, Ralph has found some to follow for you. I haven't found any footprints just yet, everybody, but I have found something special to show you. And uh, I just need to jump off the vehicle quickly so that I can grab it. Now, what is that? Let's have a look at that, everyone. That's a big pile of something. What do you think that is? You guys can think about that. And it's got all sorts inside there. If we look at this here, look, it's got some sticks and all sorts. Wow, this is full of branches and sticks and some grass. And it's got some seeds in it over there. Sorry that I throw my fingers in front of the picture. There's some little seeds as well. It's full of all sorts of things, isn't it? There it is. So, really interesting, isn't it? But what do you think it is? What could it be if we break it open a little bit? And we look inside. Come on, guys. Let's have your guesses. What is this? Should we smell it? We feel it? Ooh, doesn't smell too bad. Hmm, smells a bit like a, like a herb garden. You know when your mom grows all those herbs outside? It's just got all lovely smells, all different smells. Well, smells a bit like that. Hmm, not too bad. I wonder what it is. Come on, what's your guesses, everyone? It's nice and big, isn't it? Look at that, very big. Wow, and it's been dropped there by something. Where did it come? Is it from a bird? Is it from a snake? What could it be from? Come on, where's your guesses? Central Elementary, you have hit the nail on the head. You said it's an elephant dung. Yes, look how big that has. Look, it's nearly as big as my head. And that's obviously come from a big male or a big man elephant. He's dropped it here after he's been feeding, walking through the trees and the grasses here. And he's been feeding nicely as he went through. And then he dropped a big poo, hey. But, um, well, it's not so bad because it's only grass and sticks and everything else. And it's not very well digested, is it? So there's all sorts of little insects that can live inside here. Now, Henry B. School, the reason I'm not wearing gloves if I'm uh, touching this poo from an elephant is because it's a herbivore. So, like horses and donkeys, it's all right if you touch that kind of poo, but you don't want to touch poo from carnivores, like your predators, like cats and dogs, because that has all sorts of bacteria inside that can make you sick. But when it's a herbivore, like horses and cows and donkeys and elephants and zebra, it's fine for us to pick it up and, and look through it and see what is inside. 
because we often find little insects and, and actually seeds of plants that the elephant has found or fed on, and then that seed is inside the poo and has a perfect place to grow from. So we're going to carry on and see if we can find some carnivores, but I know my friend James out on foot, he's found you a wonderful antelope. Yes, we have an antelope. It's the same antelope that was sitting with the wildebeest a little bit earlier, a herd of impala. And you can see perhaps the male there, the one with the horns, he's chasing his girlfriend back to all his other girlfriends. And this particular male has got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 girlfriends. I don't even have one girlfriend and he's got 14 of them. Isn't that unbelievable? Now look where I'm standing. I'm standing up here a little bit like those two birds you first saw with Ralph, the fork-tailed drongo and the grey go-away bird. Now this tree is very interesting. It's one of the most common trees that we find here. It's called a marula tree. But I want you to tell me what you think happened to this tree. Look how it's broken over here. What do you think happened here? Look how big it is. What do you think pushed it over? I'd love to know, so quickly try and tell me. And I will tell you before you tell me that I know what pushed it over. I can see lots of where places where beetles have got in here. <laughs> I'm perhaps looking a little bit thin. Uh, Aiden, I had two very good meals today. You say, are oh, there vegetables here? Yes, there are vegetables here. We get the same food that you get. Uh, we just go to the town down the way. It takes a little bit longer to get to our grocery store than it takes you. But we eat exactly what you do. We eat spinach and carrots and potatoes and gem squashes and patty pans and asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower and aubergines and all manner of other vegetables. So I ate very well today. I had some banana smoothie, believe it or not, for my lunch, along with some nuts. <coughs> now, Audrey and David, you're absolutely correct. You say that a storm blew this tree over. Now, a lot of people would have said, I think an elephant pushed it over. And elephants do push over lots of trees, but not ones this big. And I'm going to ask Sebastian to come down here. I'll sit here. <coughs> And then we can have a look at how it is that a storm managed to push this tree over. If you look in here, you can see that there are a lot of pieces of dung. Little bits and pieces here. And so things have been living in here. And you can see, therefore, that there were holes in this wood. It wasn't solid wood like this here. If this solid wood had been all the way through the tree when this storm came through, it would not have been pushed over. But there were lots and lots and lots of insects and possibly birds nesting in this tree. And that made it very weak and it filled it with fungus which rotted away the beautiful wood of the marula tree. Okay, now I told you what didn't do this to the tree. Brent has that very animal right now. And indeed we do, so we couldn't find any wild dogs, but we have found you the biggest land mammal in the world, the African savannah elephant. A nice little herd of them, all feeding, breaking trees, pushing them down, eating grass, having the best time. There's probably about 15 or, or so elephants spread out through the bush. We can only see two at the moment because it is quite thick. Now, Brandon's asking why doesn't the elephant digest all the grass it eats? Well, Brandon, it's because they don't have a very good digestive system. And the reason for that is that they are what we would call keystone species so if they digested everything well they wouldn't push down so many trees or break so many branches and and uh, there also wouldn't be nearly as much elephant dung which is an important fertilizer here 
So they've evolved not to do that because they help change the bush and keep the bush healthy. <laughs> My elephants can run and they can run much faster than a human being and they can run up to about 50 kilometers an hour. Even as fast as 55 if they're in a real hurry. Now, the easiest way to tell an adult boy and girl elephant apart, Abigail, is purely from their size. A big boy is much, much bigger than a big girl, but when they're little, you look at the shape of their head. Now, a, f a female has a sharp angle on its head. I'm trying to see if, there we go, you can see. Whereas the male's heads are more rounded. I can't see any boys just yet at the moment, only girls. Oh, the wind is very strong. Sophia, the elephant's tail is not small at all. Um, it is actually very big, and uh, it swings to keep their flies away from their bottom, so it's the perfect size for its job, and it is quite big. That elephant tail is probably over, a, or it is over a meter long, and that's without all the bristles and hairs. I'm just going to try and move a little bit to get you a better, better view. <coughs> okay, so while I try get you a better view let's send you back to Rolf who's got a massive herd of impala yes and look at this this male impala he's got lots of females and little youngsters that he needs to look after he's the only big male in the area and well he's got himself a big group or a big family that uh, well, they're all relying on him now to protect them. And it seems like they've all come together like this because they've probably smelt that there's a lion or a leopard nearby. So when they do smell something like that, then they all come together and they make sure that they're all looking in all different directions so that they can see if the predator starts to come closer. But you can see which ones are the girls or the females. They don't have horns. The big male there's got horns, but then in the group you can also see little horns on some of the animals. Those are young males or small boys uh, like you might find in, in your classroom. Young boys that are uh, just uh, budding men and the rest are all the ladies or the females. No horns on them. Now, Alan, those horns are curved because that's um, special for impala. Some of the animals, uh, the antelope, they don't have curved horns, but uh, they use that to fight with other male impala, and uh, it's just the way that they're... Uh, their genetics are if you know anything about genetics or it's why you have blue eyes and blonde hair or brown eyes and brown hair it's uh, well it's one of those things that uh, impala have that is special they have small curved horns but they're not like ant like your dear uh, antlers that will fall off every year these stay with the animal for their entire life. So if he breaks one of those horns, it won't grow back. Then he'll be like a unicorn, won't he? So he does need to be careful not to break his horns, but they are very strong, so it's quite difficult to break them. Abigail, impala don't really live much past uh, or anywhere near to 10 years uh, of age. So that it, it's much like a, a quite a big dog, uh, that they don't grow much older than that. And I'm, I think that this impala here, he's probably about five or six years old, because he's, he's really good looking, isn't he? And he's got himself lots of ladies, and he needs to look after them very well. So... They're all together. I wonder where this lion or leopard is. 
But we're also next to a, a, a little dam where there's quite a bit of water. So we're going we're gonna to sit here and look and see if we can find anything here next to the water. And I know an animal that loves water, and I think Brent has found one of them. And we're still with the same group of elephants. And they're moving into some thickets now as they feed. Now, elephants need to eat. Well, they eat for almost um, 20 hours a day, so they don't sleep very much. And when they do sleep, it's for very, very short periods of time. And here we go. They're going to disappear into the thickets. Ah, now, Gavin, you've asked a very interesting question about an elephant's foot. And does it have pads on it? Yes, it's got a very thick pad. Unfortunately, we just can't really see any of their feet at the moment. Let's try and see. There we go. You can see the trunk and picking up something to eat. So their feet are very, very interesting because they are shaped very differently. Now, I'm going to show you what an elephant's f inside of an elephant's foot looks like. So <coughs> it's shaped like this. So it's got five toes. It's like this. Or four toes and that it's shaped like this and then on the inside is a big spongy piece of cartilage that works as a shock absorber so they they to be able to carry that massive weight and then a very big thick pad on the bottom but with that big shock absorber in the middle which is very very cool and that enables them to get so big and not hurt their feet while they're walking Okay, well, we're going to leave our elephants to disappear off into these thickets. I'm going to head towards a big water hole, see if I can find some hippopotamus. Okay. We shouldn't be too far. Oh before we can get uh, some nice views of some hippo. Maybe the elephants will come join us down there for a drink. In the meantime, let's go to James, who's striding down the road. One of the things that is so exciting about being at a waterhole on a warm day like today is that things come down to drink. I'm not sure how much is going to come down on a windy day like today, but maybe that will happen a little bit later. Now, what we have here is a very interesting tree that the elephants really like to eat, and it is called the round-leafed teak. Now, you can see that this round-leafed teak is not very tall. Can you see that? And... In some places you can make furniture from this tree, but here, because we have elephants, like the ones you've just seen, we don't get them that big. The elephants break them off when they're very small, and if I bring you around this way over here, you can see a particularly amazing example, careful there Sebastian, don't fall there, of what or how thick the trunk of this tree would be. Look over here. Can you see, this is the exactly sa the same tree, the round leaf teak. Look how fat the base of the tree is. So you can imagine, it would be a massive tree if it was not for the elephants. Now this is just one small example of how an elephant completely changes the landscape. If there were no elephants in this area, this place would look completely different. I don't know how it would look, but it would look completely different from what it looks now. Now, one of the things also that people ask us most often is, aren't you scared of snakes and being bitten by them? Nathan, we get plenty of snakes over here, but snakes are even more afraid of you than they are of, than you are of them. Which means that they move away as soon as they hear us walking like this. They've got very special sensors on their bodies and on their heads, and they're able to get away from us before we come near them. So we don't see a lot of snakes, but there are a lot of snakes around here. <laughs> I think for this question, Molly, we're going to go onto the road and I'm going to draw your picture, because it's very difficult to answer otherwise. And I think actually we had some interesting footprints here. Ooh! In fact, okay, there are two things here. Let me just quickly show you about Africa first. 
and then I'm going to explain this amazing scene unfolding here. So here's a picture of Africa. I can't draw very well. I bet all of you can draw better than me. There's a termites there. That's what Africa looks like, okay? South Africa is over here. It's a relatively large country in Africa, but the equator runs all the way along the middle of Africa like that. In fact, it runs a little bit further down than that. Anyway, we, don't, we won't worry about that. Let's just pretend it runs through there. Okay, this is an enormous area, everybody. So northern Africa in this part here is almost a desert. And it has what we call a Mediterranean climate, which means they get a little bit of rain in the winter time only. And this whole area here is a huge desert known as the Sahara Desert. Now we're all the way down here in South Africa, which is thousands of miles away from there, thousands of miles. And in South Africa itself, we've got masses of different kinds of climates. And if I look down here, I'll tell you that this is where Cape Town is. That's also got a Mediterranean climate, which means it gets rainfall in winter. We're over here in what we call the low felt, where it's very, very hot in the summertime and not very cold in the winter. It's quite nice. Up here, you may have heard of Johannesburg, which is the biggest city in South Africa. There, it's much higher up, like uh, Denver in the United States. It's that high up, and so it gets much colder there, but not nearly as cold as some of the places in the United States. It very seldom gets snow. And so the climate is very different throughout our country of South Africa, but we don't uh, experience anything like they experience all the way, thousands of miles up north here, where there's the Sahara Desert, where there's no rain at all and then these northern parts where you have a place like Morocco or Libya or Egypt over here where all the pyramids are. You know where the pyramids are? They're about there in the desert. Okay, so that's the geography. Now come over here and look what we have here. We've got some very clever creatures. They are termites and they're a special kind of termite called a harvester termite. They don't build those big mounds that you'd expect to see out here in Africa. Those are built by a different kind of termite. And these are called harvester termites. And look, they've cut the grass, and now they're taking it down into their underground burrow. Isn't that amazing? See how lots of them have gathered the food? Some of them are taking it down, and others are just going out to fetch more food. It's so clever. No one's telling them what to do, they just know. Just a beautiful scene. So these are tiny little things that eat a lot of grass. Let's go to some bigger things that eat even... Here we go. Well, I told you we'd go have a look at some big fat hippos all lounging about in the water. Now, the hippos spend the day in the water and they come out at night and they go out grazing so they eat lots of grass and uh, they get sunburnt badly during the day, that's why they tend to prefer to be in the water. Now, a big male hippo's teeth, Sana, are really big. Oh, look at the little baby there. Sometimes the babies will try to play and climb up on the mom's back. Now, a big hippo's teeth can be longer than 60 centimeters. Isn't that massive? So, longer than my forearm. And a hippo's teeth can chop a person in half. Well, Juliana, I don't think hippos are the most dangerous animal in the world. I think people are. Oh, look there quickly, Vim. Um, but the thing is, what happens is just a very pretty bird. Before I finish talking about the hippos, see the little bee eater. He's a little bit to the left, on the where the yellow flowers are. There we go, just above the yellow flowers. There he is. Very pretty little bird called a bee eater. 
that catches bees and then it beats them on a stick before it eats them so they can't sting him. Now, Juliana, hippos are often considered to be the most one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. Uh, when people are on small boats, um, the hippos can chomp those boats or knock the boats over. Also at night, if you get between a hippo in the water when it's feeling threatened or dangerous, they can be very, very dangerous. But when they're in the water like this, they're not so bad as long as you are not on a little boat near them. Yeah, it's mom and a little one. And it has been wonderful having you guys with us. It's been absolutely fantastic. I hope you'll join us for another school drive soon. And hopefully next time I can find you a leopard or wild dog. For those of you who are staying with us, we're going to send you across to Ralph. So now that the school drive is finished, I'd just like to welcome all our regular viewers and please don't forget to join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments uh, because we'd love for you to be involved. Now let's get back to business. I'm heading down towards um, Twin Dams uh, because I'm trying to catch up on on Tandi and Tlalamba and I've heard that they have moved down into that area. Now that's not my entire focus. Obviously I'm going to stop for everything in between and we're just using that as, as a sort of end goal. And the reason why I'm following Tandi and Tlalamba is because um, this week's show that is going to be my character that I'm going to be focusing on. So I'm obviously just trying to keep up with her movements and the movements of her little cub. So that's the idea but as we've been saying it's a very blustery afternoon and uh, you can see it with a lot of the animals being on edge those impala uh, all clumped together not necessarily that uh, there's there's a predator uh, in the direct vicinity but they do get very nervous um, uh, you know and it's also not that great to walk out on foot as I'm sure that James has mentioned to you because you you know that the wind is swirling um, you can't hear any um, warning signs that you would get from the normally potentially dangerous animals um, and the potentially dangerous animals are also all very nervous as well like the elephants and particularly rhinos um, I've found that when I've found rhinos when it's very windy like this they are extremely nervous and um, you know a big animal like that when it's very nervous uh, it can be quite dangerous because um, you know it's almost like that an anxious aggressiveness uh, that uh, that sort of starts to show through but um, nonetheless we're out on the vehicle so we're pretty safe and, um, and that's obviously why James is walking the open areas. Uh, he's not going to go walking in the thick stuff because of that particular reason. But I'm, I'm sure he's explained that to you. So as I say, heading towards Twin Dams. Ooh, there's a little road that I haven't driven, uh, I think. So I'll just take that. Let's keep looking. Oh, okay. So I think I've taken this new road and I don't have much signal. So let's uh, head you on over to the man himself, James. I'm not sure why I'm the man himself today, but I'm very pleased to be the man himself. Sebastian, do you know why I'm the man himself? No. Uh, we were nearly caught, uh, both Sebastian and I, during this last link. This is why I'm standing close to this tree. Uh, well, relieving ourselves to, to find a point on it. I thankfully uh, was done by the time we came across to us. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't have time to start. Yes, and Sebastian didn't have time to start. That is known as an overshare, everybody. We are oversharing with you now. That is how close we feel to you these days. Please continue to ask us your questions, hashtag for life, or on the YouTube chat stream, not about the overshare. You may not ask any questions about that. What we have here is a tangled example of a albizia or false thorn and this tangled example of a false thorn I'm not sure which one it is it could possibly be the common false thorn or albizia harvii that has managed to somehow escape the attentions of the elephants and get this big it would certainly be the biggest one I've ever seen but I think much more likely is that it's the large 
fruited false thorn or Albizia forbesii. And here you can see why it looks like it does, why it is this tangled mass and very untidy tree, which of course they can be extremely tidy uh, and umbrella sort of thorn shaped. And there's the reason the elephants really enjoy the old false thorn. Romit, I know that you asked a question. I missed it entirely. I'm going to ask Kirsten to give it to me again. Oh, well, we have quite a lot of diversity here, Romit, but nothing like, and this is going to be an interesting answer to you, the Cape Floral Kingdom. The Cape Floral Kingdom uh, down in the Cape, unsurprisingly, has far more species than even rainforests. And I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, because of the Cape Floral Kingdom, I think that we have the second, South Africa is the second or third most species-rich country in the world. I think Brazil is first. So even if you were to go into the rainforests of Central Africa, in general the rule, Romit, is that if you go into a, <clears throat> the closer to the equator you get, the warmer and wetter it gets, the more the species diversity will be. But there is this very interesting Feinbos or Cape Floral Kingdom down in South Africa, which is massively, massively diverse. So I, I guess other than the Cape Floral Kingdom, it would be uh, the areas closest to the equator, probably the rainforests of the Congo Basin, I imagine. And the drier it gets and the colder it gets in winter, so the diversity will go down. Now, we have had reports of Thandi and Tlalamba coming down towards... You can see her? No? Ah, the stuff I need for that thing that we're going to do when we aren't on air. Thank you, well done. We have to do a little promotion thing after we're all fair. We'll remember the spot. There were some tracks, as I said, of Tundi heading towards the pans down here. So we're going to go and have a look there and see what we can come up with uh, while we do this thing off air. Let's go across to Brentley O. Smith. Welcome, welcome back. We are ah, in search of leopards now on the southern or the western boundary of Chitwa. What have we got there? Hello, the vulture. Are you just sitting there for good measure or is there something below you? I don't think there's anything below. I just think he's found a spot to roost with all the wind around. White-backed vulture. Hello, Tamu, who's nine years old. Tamu would like to know, are there any birds that fly all day, every day? Ye almost all day, every day. Uh, some of the swifts and the swallows will stay in the air for days and days and days, all night and all day. But they will have to, normally they'll even mate in the air, but they will, uh, the female will come down, of course, when she's got to lay her eggs. But yes, there are some birds that stay up all day long and all night long sometimes. Certain of the swifts. And uh, quite a lot of your, the seabirds as well can stay up in the air for really long periods. Quite a few little birds around here. All fluttering about. Oh, this wind is not good for looking at birds. They all disappear quickly. What do you got there? I didn't even see which one it was. Sisticula, maybe. Uh, Yes, birds do have taste buds, Lorena. Um, they do. Not quite. I'm trying to remember if they've got more or less than us. I think they might have more taste buds than us. I, mean, I have to remember now. Hmm. Now, elephants. See, as if birds have less than, than we do. Um, but uh, an animal like an elephant has far more taste buds than we do. 
And uh, strangely enough, certain people have more taste buds than others. So it's, there's no exact amount of taste buds that an individual has, but uh, some people can have more than others. And also it probably explains people's tastes. People with not too many taste buds try set it to fire with too hot chili. And you can't have all the taste buds in the world if you are doing that with those really, really hot chilies. Ooh, I like some chili, but oof. Jandre eats a huge amount of hot stuff. Actually, one of the funniest moments is um, I was making some uh, chilies. I was cutting habanera and do olive oil and garlic. And Jandre saw it and he went, oh, that looks good. And he took a huge spoon and we watched him cry. It was very, very amusing. Okay. So far, can't seem to see any sign of leopards on Chitwa. Uh, we're going to keep checking down towards the airstrip now. While we do that, let's go see our off search for Tandy is going. Okay, it seems that um, uh, the, the roles have switched a little bit between Brent and myself, and that's uh, why I'm speeding up now. It sounds like there might be a little bit of uh, action around where Brent left, and uh, um, I think they might have spotted the wild dogs again. So we know how fast they move, so I'm going to start to speed up and head in that direction. Um, and that's, that's it, eh? I mean... When we go out and we, we, we're looking for animals when we're out here, we're also listening to the radio. We try to catch up on, on you know, our own tracks and try and find animals ourselves. Um, but obviously we work in tandem with all the lodges in the area. And if there's any high profile sightings, we obviously follow up on that. And we haven't seen wild dogs for so long that it would be wonderful if we could find them. This morning I was racing around trying to catch up with them because James had seen two, but just their tail disappearing off into the thickets. And so he knew which direction they had moved in. But as I said this morning, uh, they could be going in one direction for five seconds and turn around and come back straight back where they came from. So it's always difficult with wild dogs. And you almost need a whole team of, of uh, vehicles to be able to find them, uh, especially when they're on the move. But I think at the moment they might have gone uh, stationary, and that's why everybody's been able to actually catch up with them but we'll see I'm not 100% sure that they have actually found them maybe they've spotted them just like James did this morning and they were moving through the thick stuff but um, nonetheless they uh, they have moved into the area where Tandi was as well so well where, where they saw some tracks of Tandi so there's, there hasn't been a viewing of Tandi today so since uh, her and Klalamba were with that Steenbok kill um, she's left that area now. I'm pretty sure it's also as a result of the presence of hyenas. Oh. And as I say, we'll always stop for something along the way that we see. Did he, did he sit? No, he did sit. There he is. Let's just get the gap through the tree there. Have you got him? Okay, Darby. Um, sort of from these dead branches that are sticking out at the bottom, uh, this one you'll see that very dark branch he's just below that uh, go down a little bit there we are good spotting Darvi well done now everyone that's a brown hooded kingfisher one of the resident kingfisher that hang around and they're insectivorous the other one that hangs around is the striped kingfisher and I was hearing them calling the other day and the woodland kingfisher have all left the little pygmy ones have all left as well. So these are the little one of the residents that have stayed. And I was likening it this morning. I was talking about cuckoos and, and all the other migratory birds and kingfishers included. Uh, I liken it to, um, you know, like our local surf break in Port Alfred. Uh, normally we've got the place to ourselves and there's, there's a handful of surfers and it's probably between 10 and 15 of us at the most on a Sunday afternoon if it's pumping. And um, we're out there, we're surfing it up and enjoying ourselves. You know, we can catch whichever wave we like. But then 
There's certain times of the year when we have traveling surfers pulling in all at the same time, and it very often then doubles. So we, we have like 20 or 30 surfers in the morning, in the, in the water. And um, then it becomes a bit edgy because we're all fighting over the same resource, uh, the, the perfect surf break, and, you know, it breaks on the same spot. So everybody's fighting over that break. And um, so it becomes a bit of conflict and uh, pressure for that space and competition. And uh, it's exactly the same with the migratory birds. When they leave, and then that pressure is released for the exactly the same amount of resources and space and competition. So I think this brown-hooded kingfish is quite happy that all the migratory kingfishes have all disappeared. He's got the place back to himself. Now, I think I'm going to move along and try and catch up with these madash or the wild dogs. But uh, it seems Brent has got one of those spiraled horned antelope. We do. We've got a few spiral horned antelope, or only one with horns, but there's a tiny little baby kudu hiding behind the bush. Look at the ears sticking out at us. Isn't that adorable? Hello, little one. Oh, sure. Probably two weeks old or so. Very cute little thing. Then comes mom. And pop out. There we go. I'm going to cross the road right in front of us. heard something very strange there for a second. It was an impala coughing it sounded like. It was a very weird sound. One of those ones. There we go. There we go little one. Off she goes across the road. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, some animals do get hiccups. I've seen monkeys and baboons with hiccups. So, yes, they do. We seem to have found a little spot down here on the southern side of Chitwa that's quite protected from the wind. And it's very lovely. Lots of animals around as well. A big group of kudu. And there's a juvenile oxpecker on the back as well as an adult. Uh, there's a big male at the back as well. Let's have a look and just see him through there. Let me go forward a little bit for you then. Now, hi, Paul, I, have, I was asking, do they all have the same amount of stripes? No, they don't. Some of them have a few more sometimes. Here's the big boy. And you can see there those wonderful spiral horns Ralph was talking about. Incredibly impressive antelope, the greater kudu. Oh, Oxpecker trying to get at the ticks in his ear. He's not too keen on it. You can see he's trying to whack the oxpecker with its ear. There we go. <laughs> Get off, you Eris. And he's following after the rest of the females that have moved into the bush behind us. Now, as in a lot of cases, those horns are not there primarily, 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 oh goodness, I can't speak today. They're not there for defense um, against predators. They're there for fighting with other males for mating rights. So even though the females don't have horns, uh, their defensive mode is listened very carefully. They also are quick runners and they have in and they can jump incredibly high. So it would be their main two forms of defense, but uh, also being very vigilant and alert. Here is the big boy following the ladies. 
across the road. Unfortunately, no sign of any cats down here. So we might have to move out of our little wind-protected spot uh, and see what else we can find uh, further to the east. Oops, there we go. Okay. Well, I'm going to do another quick loop through Chitwa. If I don't find any tracks, I'm going to head back towards Juma. Uh, in the meantime, it's James is on foot looking for the beloved Tandy. I have also managed to get myself in amongst a little, well, it was one plant of stinging nettles, and I am now itching horribly. The pain pro, um, part of the procedure is finished, and now I'm into the itch. Suddenly Rexon went quiet here and he started looking because there are birds alarming along this little drainage system. So let's go down and have a look and see if perhaps we can't find something of interest. What a tree there, Sebastian. Nothing. Now you might be able to hear the magpie shrikes calling. There are a couple of starlings going and Paul, these are all calls that you will hear during the winter because they are not migrant birds. But there are inescapably fewer birds during the winter. They would definitely see far fewer birds and hear far fewer birds during the winter months compared with the summer. There's a bird that is flying along the trees here, just moving along going might be a territorial dispute between two flocks of these magpie shrikes, but I think they've seen something they don't like. And I don't think it's us. Let's just stick our heads down here. And see the Magpie shrikes flying there. There they go. Okay. That rasping call they make, that kick, 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 is an alarm. It's a very nice cave over there, Sebastian, where you might want to give birth if you were a leopard. This is around the area where the tracks were currently heading. In the tracks of Tundi, that is. No, Rex doesn't think it's anything of particular note here. Gemma, I'm just going to have to ask you, how come you are not wearing glasses? Gemma, I am wearing gaiters. Here they are. They're just very cheap gaiters. They're not like the magnificent things that uh, yeah. <laughs> David is wearing here. David has managed to find some spectacular gaiters. Uh, he borrowed them from Senzo, who in turn um, traded them for something from Jared in the engineering department. Those are very fine. They are from the United States. Hello, David. In fact, David's entire artwork is quite spectacular, including the sergeant's stripes. Did we say a sergeant? I think there's a sergeant's stripes. Sergeant... Major, maybe, maybe yeah. Major David Gitu, Major David Gitu of the Sarbi Sand Regiment of Wild Earth. Whoops. Okay, let's go up here. Uh, the gators, for those of you who don't know, are really quite important from my point of view, not so much for ticks, but for the scourge of Tragus berteronianus which of course is the carrot seed grass, dreadful, dreadful thing that will get stuck in your socks and you'll never wear them again. The scourge of Tragus berteronianus is not something that must be taken lightly. Ah, it is with great excitement that I hand you over to Ralph Kirsten, who is apparently on the trail of some hounds.
Oh, sorry about that, everybody. I didn't uh, hear anything there. But um, while we're just coming up here past Treehouse Dam and just having a look, uh, because we did hear that there were some wild dogs running around in the area, but um, at the moment not seeing anything just yet. So we're going to loop around from here back towards Twin Dam. We'll just stop. There's a couple of geese there. Not much else, but sometimes you do need to have just a quick scan just to see if um, anything is around. And, well, it's only the geese for now. Those are Egyptian geese. And this isn't Biffle's Hook Dam, so don't get worried, anybody, because uh, they haven't lost the little goslings. We did see the little goslings with the, with the Egyptian geese at Biffle's Hook, but they were getting blown straight across the, the pan. And, uh, well, I think they went to go and take cover. And there's a couple of Cape turtle doves. Look at that male. It looks like he's uh, trying to attract that female. Uh, some you, there are some animals that um, that can't swim at all, um, such as possibly a honey badger. Oh, I'm just turning that radio down. Uh, such as a honey badger. Some of the tortoises can't swim as well. Um, and uh, the leopard tortoise is one of the only tortoises that can swim. Even though they get very big, um, they can swim. Now another one that's quite interesting and Steve found it this morning is a bushveld rain frog. In fact they can't swim and you would think that that is absolutely crazy because it's a frog, it's an amphibian, uh, amph uh, amphi and bios meaning uh, two lives but they live uh, almost completely in water. However with the bushveld rain frog they don't live in water, they live in wet sand and um, when they want to go in water or cross a little pond or, or a, a river they will just inflate themselves and their little legs sticking out of the edges almost like a big fat balloon and they'll either get blown across the water or they'll get washed by the current and when they get to the other side they deflate themselves. So very interesting that today. Eh? A frog that cannot swim, all he does is float. Um, so yes, there are some animals that can't swim. There's lots of them, but there's also lots that can. Now, I think we can head on over towards... Oh, another one is hippos. Thanks you, Kirsten, in FC. Uh, hippos actually can't really swim that well. They run on the bottom and they do a bit of porpoising, but they don't really swim as you would expect, like a, a frog stroke or a, uh, um, what do we call it, breast stroke or a crawl type movement or doggy paddle. Um, they don't do anything of that. They literally sink to the bottom and run. And that's why they can move pretty fast when they're in the water. But uh, they're not doing it by swimming. Now, this is an interesting little area. This is where the elephants were that I had this morning. There's lots of signs of them, but they seem to have moved off. So, let's head down towards Twin Dam. And speaking of dam, uh, Brent has still that one as well. <laughs> I'm not, unfortunately, by the dam. Liam, can we just look at the clearing there? I just thought I saw something shooting at high speed across. Okay, let's get over there because the dogs do like to pop out at Chitwa Dam and I just saw something running. Well, once we get there, we'll see if there's um, impala and waterbuck and, and the like. We've just done a, a cruise through the, the back end uh, uh, of Chitwa looking for any sign of possibly quarantine or Kuchava. Uh, unfortunately, no tracks at the moment. Start making our way back towards the Juma and are hoping that the dogs will be on the move and might pop out in front of us. Okay, let's just have a quick look out here. Now, of course, Impala will alarm at the big cats, but when they see a wild dog, they just take off. Now, that's how I saw the dog this morning, uh, this, uh, around lunchtime. And literally, an impala just shot right out of the bush in front of me. 
And then I looked and then I saw one dog disappearing in the other direction. So hopefully we'll have some puppy puppy love this afternoon. In the meantime, let's go see how James's search for the difficult to find Tandy is going. It's actually not going too badly, everybody. We've got tracks on the road here. We think are very fresh. Both mother and cub have come a long way from where they were yesterday. And they're going on and off the road. Rex is just checking there. I can hear an alarm call here. You get that feeling that you're being watched. Rex? Rex? Rex on. Not there. I'm just going to check down here, everybody, where this bird is alarming. You can see the bird moving. Very, very slowly. Do not want to be charged by Tandy. That will be unpleasant. Result in me becoming afraid. Deeply so. Perfect little drainage system. She spent a lot of time here. Karula used to spend a lot of time here. Let's just walk down here. We think these tracks are fresh. But it has been very windy, which makes it difficult to tell. So you'll excuse me not looking at you as I try and figure out what's going on here. Our leopard will become invisible in this long grass. So what we're just looking for is the flash of the white tail walking through the long grass. Perhaps just a little bit of gold and black. Now the chances of Tundi getting that upset with us are small because Tlalamba of course is now able to climb and so she can get away from any real threat. Let's just look through here. Gemma, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking. I agree. Especially when you can hear the birds alarming and the grass is so long that you cannot really see what's going on. But this leopard is not far would easily have spotted us. In fact, most likely to have spotted us. What we don't want to do is give her a fright so she keeps moving. If she has settled slightly, we want to know about it. Rex is just up top there. You say I get. I told you I get the feeling I'm being watched. You, it's a kudu. You say I am being watched by a thousand two two thousand five hundred viewers. You're absolutely correct. There's a kudu. Well done. They're not alarming. They're not alarm calling. So I don't think that they are running from a leopard. I think that's what's frightened the Franklins there. They would almost certainly, well, they're definitely alarm call if they saw a leopard. We saw kudus with shidulu this morning, and they're definitely alarm called. So I'm going to continue along this way. And we'll stay up above the line of the little riverbed here. Just to give us a bit of height advantage over what's going on. Right, this is very exciting. We're going to concentrate here. Ralphie is not far from here. Those dogs were not far from here. Anything could happen. And that is very exciting, isn't it? We're just quickly poking in uh, our noses here at Twin Dams just to see if there's anything happening or any signs of life. 
and then we'll probably make our way over towards where James is because um, I'm sure it's going to start getting dark pretty soon and then um, well then we'll also be able to put the spotlight out and be able to hopefully pick up on Tundi and Palumba or we'll maybe be able to see some of those wild dogs which would be absolutely fantastic now there's just a couple of impala here next to twin dams and he's doing his whole rutting calls let's just maybe try and stop and listen to him just get a view in there they're quite fascinating to watch when they actually do it because they um let me just go around a little bit more it's like really coming from the throat firstly from the nose and then from the throat Stop here. Let's just see him there. If he does, how's that? A little bit further forward there. Let's just watch him there. I just want to see if he ruts and putting that nose up and doing all the specific calls that I'm talking about. There, he's broken the end of the end of his one horn off, probably through fighting with other males. There's a couple of times I've actually seen Impala getting stuck. Um, but I've seen it more so with springbok actually getting stuck and hooked with their horns and eventually um, succumbing uh, from probably just through exhaustion. Um, and I've, uh, I've seen that a couple of times in Namibia and in South Africa in the, in the Karoo. And I've also seen when they're busy fighting and getting stuck and then a, a leopard coming in and catching both of them. They couldn't get away. They're both pulling in different directions and they were literally locked. A romit, um, a very good question that. Uh, which um, of the antelope are only found in southern Africa? I think springbok has to be one of them because you don't find springbok further, further north than Angola I think. Um, the black-faced impala in Namibia is endemic to Namibia and the southern parts of Angola. Um, so they're a subspecies of the, of the impala, but uh, that's one that you don't get anywhere else. Um, I'm thinking what else? Uh, probably something like the blue dacre. You don't get anywhere else except in southern Africa as well. That's quite a special um, antelope, uh, one of the smallest in the world. Um, and you only get that down the sort of east east um, coast of South Africa in the foresty areas. They like that thicket biome. Um, what else? Probably our, our um, the common or grand kudu. Uh, I don't think that you... No, we also get those up in the Maasai Mara. So we'll get that in East Africa too. There's not a lot of them, but you do get them there. So that's not one. Um, what else? Bushbuck. We also get up there. Nyala. Get in East Africa. So there's, there's a couple of subspecies or, or special ones that don't occur up north. But most of them, you see, because um, it, it's not... Um, it's not separated by water or anything, Africa. So a lot of the animals are able or were sort of historically able to move uh, between the different countries. And, and so you do find uh, the species spread throughout Africa, albeit now some of the areas um, having more subspecies in the, in the different countries. And now we've split them up where they can't actually get to each other because of a lot of fences and boundaries that we've put between countries and veterinary fences to stop diseases being spread between domestic cattle and uh, wildlife. So it's pretty much stopped all the migratory patterns and routes that historically would have been there. Okay, I think I'm going to leave this uh, half one half horn impala and head towards James because I think uh, there's lots of action hitching up over there and let's head on over to him and see how it's going. Well, we haven't moved far from where you last saw us. I've come and I've looked through the drainage. Nothing here. I didn't think there would be because those kudu did not alarm call. Rexon managed to find no further tracks. He did a whole loop round on the road. So let's go back up to where the last tracks were and see if we can't figure out what's going on. 
course, it's at this stage that you would normally now completely relax, start wandering like this, and oh, she'll explode to come out. A big spider here. Hello, Lily, age seven. It seems to be that it's been a long time since we've heard from you. It's wonderful to have you back with us. And you want to know if the big cats will run away from us before they'll run towards us. Yes, they definitely will, Lily. That's the big thing. We don't want to give them a fright. We want to be careful that we have respect them and don't give them a fright. Now, you're looking at a massive golden orbweb spider there. But I'm not going to stop and talk about it. Let's just keep going. We've just got to get Seb out from underneath the web here. Um, there you go. If you duck, yeah, keep going. And you're up. There we go. I'm amazed we didn't lose signal there. We might have. Okay, so we're going to go back up onto the road. And we can see what we can find. It's fantastic. Lily is pretty eerie walking through here with all of this grass blowing, as Sebastian says. <laughs> Tucker, on Sunday, I went to see Steph, who I'm sure you remember. Steph is one of our guides, and he was at home with his family. And out of their roof, Yes, on Saturday, a squirrel fell. And Tucker, they've kept that squirrel as a pet just until it's healthy enough to leave. So what they do is they'll keep the squirrel in the house, they'll give it food, but eventually the squirrel, when it grows up, will leave. And it does this of its own accord. So. Your mother is not incorrect when she says we shouldn't keep squirrels as pets because, of course, we don't want to keep wild animals in captivity. But in this particular case with a squirrel, you'll probably find that once it gets big enough, if you don't put it in a cage, it will probably just leave of its own accord. So I don't think it's too bad to have a squirrel as a friend. Okay, there is Rickson. Let's go and ask him what he's seen. So the leopards have moved either off that way or up that way. And I wonder if they haven't gone towards Treehouse Dam, which is where Ralph was a little bit earlier. And if there are dogs around, well, then those dogs are going to put the cats up the tree. I'm going to have a small conference with Rex while I do that. Let's go and find out if Leo Smith is still on to part Twa. I am not. I am on Juma Juma. Um, I'm coming to see what we can find here. It's going quite slowly, especially in this wind, looking for any sign of anything really. Uh, I try to go back to that Ellie herd, but we went into Little Gowrie. So I think I've got a feeling we're going to find something on Juma today. That's what I think. Uh, we haven't seen any tracks just yet. We actually haven't seen, oh, we saw some wild dog tracks, but they weren't fresh they were from, from, from much earlier today. I think from around lunchtime when I, when I saw the one. Now there's another pack of wild dogs up in the north and I'm waiting to hear which way they get moving. It's getting chilly now. Lots of impala all over the place. Oh, looking a little bit nervous in the wind. Oh, these tracks are very fresh because they're on top of mine and they are leopard tracks. And they look like tundies. These are on top of where I drove. Did I drive here, Bim? No, I didn't. I don't think we drove here, but. Maybe Rolf did. Actually, I know Aubrey did. Okay, these tracks are ver fresh, ver ver fresh, especially in the wind because they haven't been sort of blown over and the edges haven't been lost. Let me drive, call Rex on the radio. 
I'm pretty sure it's the same set of tracks that they're following. Come on, there we go. Rex, Rex, do you copy? Uh, I'm just trying to get hold of Rexon. It's very fresh tracks, very exciting. Rex, Rex, do you copy? Rex, it is. In Gonzo, you've got, uh, whereabouts are they? You see here, she goes in. She's still here. And there's another track coming back and going that way. Okay, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna... And there's tracks, more tracks. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you across to Rolf while I chat to James and Rex. Yes, everybody. Well, um, I'm just looking for a little way through here because we did find some tracks of Tandy, as I think Brent has and James have as well. But it seemed like um, I've got. Uh, a little bit ahead of the other guys and uh, it looks like they've headed down into the Milwati. I hope we don't lose signal. It is possible. Let me take low range as we go underneath this wonderful jackalberry here. Oh, look at that. We've got a lovely steep descent here. And uh, just going to see if she's possibly moved along in the riverbed here because she's definitely headed down into here. But for all cases and purposes she might have just carried on going through there on the other side but it's worth having a look in the river bed itself so we will just try and see if she's maybe just rested up in here you know it makes sense if it's quite windy like this you get down nicely into a little river bed like this and it's quite um, uh, out of the wind so you very often find a rhino doing something similar as well Okay, it seems all three of us are looking for Tandy and Slalamba. Let's uh, let's go to James and see if he's got any other clues. I have no clues, but what I do have here is a very interesting kind of development that I wasn't expecting to find here. We're at the old hyena den just off Philemon's cut line, which is about 500 meters from the southern boundary. And what we have here is a great spattering of hippo dung. Now, there is no water anywhere near us here. And, it, well, there is Treehouse Dam, which is another sort of 500 metres, 400 metres or so, quarter of a mile away. It just gives you an idea of how far they walk, the hippo. And, I mean, there hasn't been hippo in Treehouse Dam for a little while. But perhaps this is where he used to come and uh, while away his lonely evenings and uh, evidence of his loneliness is found here because it is only the dung of one hippopotamus. Shame. Maybe he found friends. Since his departure from Treehouse Dam, he could easily, of course, be the world's most boring hippo that now lives in Bifflesook Dam. Oh, and apparently hippopotamus was seen on the Juma Dam cam the other night, but uh, I think this is, I mean, this is almost fossilised. This is really very old. This would have been quite good for our little trick earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good vintage. Herbivore dung, especially elephant dung, but most herbivore dung, if you uh, open it up like that after it's dried, is actually delicious. It smells very herby. Wonderful. Okay, let's go across to Ralph. He has got something, uh, I'm trying to think of something clever to say. I can't. Just go to him. Uh, thanks, James. Well, you're not feeling too clever. Well, this guy, this beautiful bull, pretty. So what you don't have in brains, you can make up for in looks. 
but I don't know if James has got either. I know he's very clever, but, um, well, I don't know. We'd have to debate that, eh, Darby? <laughs> Um, well, this Nyala bull, nice and close to us, he's just carried on feeding here. It looks like he's eating a little bit of the jackalberry um, saplings, or what do you call them, seedlings. I'm getting a bit bigger than that. Now he's having a go at it, but probably wiping some of his glands on it there. Paula, a set of horns like that probably weighs in the region of that can be quite and um, uh, with the skull as well, so maybe a little bit less than that, but you see how he has got beautiful ivory the end of his, horn, the end of his horns. Now he's getting quite worried there over to the right there somewhere. I wonder if there's a leopard or something walking in there. Maybe Tundi is around. But he is very pretty indeed. Okay, the gremlins are attacking because we're down here in the riverbed. Uh, so we need to keep moving over to Brent, see how it's going there. Well, we are still just checking around the area where James and Rex lost the tracks, or last had the tracks. I'm sure they're going to find them again. Uh, so we're just doing a, a little loop around them, uh, giving them a hand, seeing if we get any luck. Now, indeed they do match. Predators do like a good windy day like this to hunt. So they are more active. It's cooler. The prey can be surprised more easily. So yes, they do tend to hunt a bit more in a day like today. Oh, We've got no trucks coming out yet, so we're going to loop again and keep looping. I think maybe we'll go check around uh, Elephant Carcass Road, see if there's anything there and up towards Treehouse Dam. So fingers crossed that well, either Tundi or the wild dogs are around. Now while we are moving through the bush here, I think it's time to put you to the test. And uh, what are we going to quiz you on today? Ah, I've got an idea. We'll quiz you on game reserves in Africa. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a relatively easy one. I want to know what country Zakuma National Park is in. There we go, there's the first one for you. Hashtag Safari Live. If you know what country Zakuma National Park is in, and no cheating with the Google machine now. Who can tell me what country Zakuma National Park is in? Now that's an easy one to start. They are going to get tougher. Bouncy bounce coming. <laughs> Dominique, yes, it is in Africa, but I would like to know which particular country in Africa, Dominique. Ah, uh, St. Mark, it is not in Zambia. It is not in Zambia. Oh dear, I thought this was an easy one. Well, well done to Alan Girl and Alistair. You guys are spot on. It is indeed in Chad. Famous for its elephants, as well as a huge variety of other animals. And those elephants have been brought back from...
foot back from the brink. I thought I heard a kudu bark. Did you hear that, Vim? This wind makes life so difficult. I could have sworn I heard a bar. Let's go forward a little bit. Oh, anyway, yeah, it is it, it, indeed, it is famous for its elephants among other things and also incredibly great bird watching. Oh, it's so hard with this wind. The wind is really howling now. Now, you've got to be very careful when you're on foot in this wind because it does make life a little bit more difficult when you can't hear everything around you. Let's go see how James is doing. Right, we have a very special grass here that will be, of course, be familiar to David. It is the red oat grass, as it's called. There you are, David. That's to make you feel like you're at home. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And that, grow, of course, grows all over the Maasai Mara, known as red oat grass there, and just plain red grass here. It doesn't grow in anything like the profusion it does there in the Mara. Ah. Well, David and I are actually talking about this ourselves, Gemma. Trees and plants found in the Masai Mara and Juma are not many. We get, of course, the, the two Balanites species. We get a Balanites species here. It's a different one from the one down in the Mara. A um, couple of the acacia species, similar but not the same. Uh, there is a Euclea species there. They've got, you get the magic quarry? Yes, the magic quarry is a good one. Yeah, so magic worry we'd expect to find there. Now, this grass, the red oat grass, as I've explained to many people before, is almost useless in this current form. And it's because it has turned to seed, it has turned to uh, make, or it has put all the energy into making the seeds. And it means that most of it is straw and fairly useful only for thatching. And it's why, at the end of a growth season, a fire through the thermida or through the red grass is often the only way to kind of get the straw away so that it starts to produce lots of these leaves down at the base again. So the greatest grazing grass in Africa, if you find this in your little patch of land, you know that you have got very nice grazing. Now, on a tundi, the note of tundi, Rex is down there. He is sitting looking for tracks. I can hear Franklin alarm calling. We're going to go and look. But while we do that, a mystery awaits you with Ralph. Yes, and it's a very big mystery indeed. But uh, these elephants, we've come up uh, along the Mlulwati and we've popped out right near to the Vuyatela Dam. But we're down... Uh, in a road I've never come along, it's just basically continuing along the, the, the river bed. So we did a bit of 4 by 4 and we found these elephants in a bit of a secret spot here. It's not really a very well used track at all, and it seems they're all quite active. They're all feeding, a bit of pushing, in, pushing and shoving between them. There's a bit of a young male around as well, and then we're just pushing him around too. Let's see, maybe that one of these will try to climb up the bank there. Always nice to watch elephants, especially when they're in a, a different area like this. They're feeding there. I think that's a bit of a young jackalberry as well. Always nice to watch elephants, eh? Everybody's happy about that. Well, just as I am too. Look at that one just leaning there. Let's see. Oh, we could have nearly seen straight into its eyeball. There's a bit of playful nature coming out again. Then they very often like to sleep on an embankment like that. That's a very nice spot for them to rest because they're, they're not really um, comfortable lying straight on their side or on flat ground. Because they do get um, 
uh, their bones are so heavy, it's a bit like a whale. Eventually they start sort of um, crushing themselves. They can't really breathe that well. Well, these two are having a whale of a time. We should say an elephant of a time. It's sad that... Uh, Uh, our Laura Moore, elephants do eat soil. It's called geophagia, and um, they'll often go to areas, especially where there's some termite mounds or there's a sodic site where um, there's a lot of mineral salts in the soil, and they'll push their tusks into the ground, loosen up that soft soil. Sometimes it's quite hard, you know, it just needs a bit of softening up with the tusks. They'll push their tusks into the ground and possibly even stand on it, loosen it up a bit more, and then they'll, then they'll put it into their mouth and feed on it. And these two are having a proper wrestling match here. Probably two young males as well. I think that's why they were, the, the sort of greater herd was a little bit edgy, because they can be when these sort of teenagers are having uh, a bit of um, wrestling matches and so on. Uh, Samu, who's nine, thank you for your question. Um, elephant, I haven't really seen elephants that go, if I can say, cuckoo or mad. Um, not, not completely, but um, sometimes when it gets very hot or um, different times of the year, they can have um, uh, you know, different uh, levels of hormones in their body. They can get a little bit angry. Uh, with each other. They can also get quite angry at us. So I think if you mean that kind of mad, yes, they can get very mad. Um, in different areas they might um, have the unfortunate uh, uh, chance of being shot at by some poachers and then they can get very mad with humans. The next ones that they see they'll want to kill them because they've um, they've been shot at and attempted, to, you know, their life been attempted on. So yes, they can be times when they'll go mad but I haven't seen an elephant that is doing things completely crazy if I can say just more so mad in the sense of being angry lots of times yes they can be mad with each other they can be mad with us Caitlin uh, Thank you for your question. Um, elephant populations um, are controlled naturally in their wild, in the wild, um, normally through uh, disease. You, you do get some diseases that the elephants can get, um, and as well, they also can uh, die of, of um, thirst if there's not enough water. Oh, look at these two. They're really having a go. There's a little bit of calling there as well. Let's see. Always nice, eh? A little bit of a trumpet. Are they really getting it going here? See, that's the reason I'm not moving, because I don't want to disturb this little wrestling match. And so, Caitlin, it's mostly down to them not having enough water or not having enough food, and then they'll lose condition and they can die that way. Um, other ways, they, they, when there's um, not enough food or water, they'll also start fighting a lot between each other, and they can kill each other too. So um, it will sometimes result from the elephants controlling themselves. But uh, once the once the resources drop, then uh, elephants need to drink a lot of water uh, every single day, and they also need to eat a lot every single day. So they will lose condition quite quickly if there's not enough food and water, and they can die um, from their, their, their organs starting to shut down when there's not enough food and water. That is one of the biggest controlling factors with elephants. Now, I'm just going to move forward a little bit because we can get a nice view on these on these two and I'm just going to pop forward a little bit let's just see if they just relax with us here Brittany there are some small things that elephants won't eat 
um, such as those euphorbia that I was speaking of earlier with the, uh, with the toxic latex. Uh, it's like the desert elephants in Namibia. In the desert there, there's a lot of different euphorbias, um, and they, they don't even go anywhere near it. And there's also um, something that uh, the local villagers do is they plant chilies around their vegetable gardens and it actually stops the elephants from going there because they have such sensitive smell that um, they can smell that, that chilies and uh, it obviously burns their nose so they don't go anywhere near that. So I would say chilies is another uh, plant that they won't eat. But uh, generally in the wild, anything that's um, quite strong smelling or tasting or, or poisonous, they won't eat that at all because they have a very strong sense of smell and, um, and they're quite sensitive to those toxins, especially the toxic latexes in the euphorbia plants. And tamboti, they also won't push over tambotis, they don't eat tamboti, so they leave those alone here. I've never seen an elephant eating tamboti. That's more so the porcupines and uh, sometimes oryx as well. The odd kudu might have a little nibble on a, on a tamboti, but they've obviously got an enzyme in the stomach that neutralizes the toxin, which the elephants don't have. Now he's eating a bit of grass. You see elephants are mixed feeders, hey? They don't just eat branches and leaves. They also do eat a lot of grass, especially like we see in the Maasai Mara, where they actually stay in the wetlands, in the marshes, and all they eat there is grass. Um, so a very sloppy nature to their dung there as well. Lots of water in their diet and mostly grass. Um, oh, have you just noticed that we here, yeah, little one? Are you going to come and show us how big you are? No, just going to play with a little piece of vine and throw it over his head and sometimes elephants when they are trying to intimidate you especially when they're next to you or if they're a young male like this little guy they'll often take some some grass and sticks and things and put it on the top of their head and I think it's trying to make themselves look a bit bigger um, you know if you're not really that confident in yourself well you put a, a very big hat on and makes you look look a lot bigger and intimidating well and that's what I think they think anyway but if you're a big bull and you're big anyway you don't need to put anything on your head to make yourself look bigger you're big enough very nice sighting this eh? it's lovely spending time with elephants Look at that, you can see straight into his ear. And as relaxed as they are, it just um, makes you feel pretty much the same, doesn't it? Very soft eyes the elephants have with very elegant eyelashes when you get to see it up close. And there's a very distinct color to their eye as well. I love looking at close ups of elephants' eyes. It's like the all seeing eye of an elephant. Very knowledgeable, I feel, when you look into an elephant's eyes. Except for this youngster, he's still got lots to learn. There's ear flaps, not too many nicks and cuts on them just yet, as you'd find in an old bull. But I, I'm always fascinated to look into an elephant's ear there as well. Oh, he's got a little hole in his ear, straight hole there, almost like a gunshot. But it's not a gunshot, I'm just saying that. It's the same hole. Yeah, it's like a piercing. I wonder if he walked into a thorn or something like that and it pierced his ear there. You see that? Just one. But it's surprising it didn't rip it. You see, that's what often happens. It gets pierced. And then they keep walking. Oh, has he spotted another one to go and chase? Either that or he's been left behind by the herd and he's just realized it. He's quite a young one. The other elephant bull, the young one has remained here just near to us, feeding there in the thickets. Like that. Oh, no, here he's popping out just in front of us. I think he has realized that, um, that the herd has uh, disappeared and that's quite often the young bulls they all of a sudden realize that mommy and the herd has moved off and they get a quick surprise now where's mommy look at him he's trying to work it out okay I think we're going to um, head up to Vuyotela Dam maybe they're having a drink while we relocate 
Let's head on over to James, who I think is walking in the long stuff. Well, we've just come across some flowers and I thought it'd be holding on me to tell you that I told you a lie the other day. I'm sorry for telling you a lie. These flowers are not the ones I told you a lie about. These flowers are, in fact, annuals. They're exotic annuals from Peru, no less, like Paddington Bear. They are Zinnia Peruviana or the Black-Eyed Susan. The flower I told you a lie about is over here. Where is it? I walked past it. Past it, I walked. And my mistake was pointed out to me inevitably by Judy H. when I said that Hibiscus micrantha, which is one of my favourite flowers, I'm sure I walked past one here, I said that it was an annual as well. I thought it died during the winter months, but it doesn't. It is, in fact, a short-lived perennial plant. The story is now meaningless because I can't find the actual flower I was talking, I was going to tell you about. For that, I apologise profusely. I seem to be doing a lot of that of late. Anyway, let's go and have a look at this purple plant here. There we are. Now, this is a plant that is an indicator of slightly wet, disturbed areas, and that's what we have here. And that's why we've got lots of herbs uh, which produce beautiful flowers and not much in the way of grass. And it's probably because we're quite close to a road. It's not very nice. Okay, let me just give you an update on what's going on with uh, the. <laughs> I just heard a comment from Paula that said she loves the randomness of flowers. I thought she was going to say the randomness of James's presenting, but I'm glad she didn't say that. Thank you very much for that, Paula. Let me just give you an update on the tracks that we had. They went into where you and I were looking over there. Uh, we don't know where they've gone from there. Rex is now, he's got to be in his bonnet. He's gone around the corner to see if he can find them again. It's getting dark now, so we're going to start making our way back towards home, I'm afraid. But... Who knows, she might pop out during the night and one of the chaps of the spotlight might be able to see her. That would be very exciting indeed. Now also indicative of disturbed areas and often on roadsides is one of the most beautiful grasses that you get here and this thing often flowers, or in fact it normally flowers at this time of year, just before we go into winter, and it is the Natal Red Top or Melanus Nervi Glumus absolutely hopeless for grazing but isn't it just beautiful it is the color of sort of blood almost in some of them fantastic a little earlier we showed you the Thermida triander the red grass and Leslie that's exactly the kind of flower or grass that would need fire to germinate not many of the trees here uh, actually die with fire and there's a great misconception that fire will help with bush clearing that it'll take away thick bush it won't most of the trees here if they will die on top you need a very hot fire to kill them on top but they'll just coppice from the bottom again and instead of having large tall trees you just have a whole lot of thick scrubby stuff if you burn too often so not many of the trees need fire in order to germinate but there are quite a few grass species and the red grass is the most obvious one it's not, that's not to say that it won't germinate without fire, but it does need fire just to kind of, and get the um, dry moribund stuff off the top. It's all right, huh? I'll manage. Thank you very much, Sebastian. My knees are not what they once were. Uh, right, speaking of red, I believe Brent has taken out his tablecloth and is now wearing it. James, it is a shuka. You know this, it is not a tablecloth. And uh, don't fall over on those wonky old knees of yours. Uh, we've made our way towards the western sections and we're just going very slowly looking for sign of anything. This cold, windy weather makes game viewing really difficult. So while we keep searching, we're going to continue to play the game reserve game. Now, who can tell me what is the oldest proclaimed nature reserve in Africa 
And what year was it proclaimed? Who can tell me what is the oldest proclaimed nature reserve in Africa and what year it was uh, proclaimed? Hashtag Friday Night if you know the answer. Oh, it's so chilly. I forgot my other jersey. Tsk, tsk, naughty Brent. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Yes, indeed, Lynn. There are many natural salt licks in Africa all over the place. Uh, even close to here, there's some big salt licks. But uh, some of the bigger salt licks and most famous salt licks are the buys in the Central African rainforests uh, that attract forest elephants and Satunga and Bongo and hogs and all that out into the open to get the minerals from there. So, yes, there's salt licks all over Africa. Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia. I said Botswana, Zambia, Kenya. Um, there's always a couple in the Mara, actually. The one pride of lions we follow is called the Salt Lick Pride. They spend so much time around uh, the Salt Lick. Actually, three in the southern sections of the Mara Triangle. Oh, <laughs> it's nearly time to get all the winter woolies out shortly. Uh, <laughs> Good guess, but unfortunately not, Jamie. Uh, Sabi Sands is actually relatively young. Uh, it was even it was proclaimed well after the Kruger National Park and uh, and and a lot of the other national parks. The Sabi Sands is only because uh, it started off as private private land, as private farms, private hunting farms, cattle farms. So the Sabi Sands, I think, has been. I can't even remember. So I think it was the late 60s. Saskia, you're getting a bit closer, uh, but it is not Kruger. Kruger is 1900. The reserve I'm looking for is five years older than Kruger. It was... Well done, Ashton. Indeed, the Amphalosi Game Reserve, 1895, it was proclaimed. Now, strange enough, it was a protected area even before colonial times. Uh, it was considered royal hunting grounds. So only the royal family could hunt there, and they only hunted there once a year. And Shagazulu proclaimed the areas between the White and Black Amphalosi River uh, as royal hunting ground if anyone was caught poaching in there you would be put to death so even it was protected before it became before the colonial powers were in so here we go that's a, it's a, one of my favorite parks in africa i spent some wonderful wonderful times there now let us think the next get game reserve question let's go with a bit of an easier one next uh, da, 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 da. Where is the first, actually that's not an easier one, I'll save that one for later. Uh, what is the biggest national park in Kenya? Hashtag Safari Live if you know the answer. What is the biggest national park in Kenya? Okay, wait. Well, I know Shadulu was up and about in this area this morning, and we know how much she zigzags, so we're hoping she might have zagged back onto Juma. <laughs> ah, Lara Moore would like to know who the royals at the time of the founding of Kikui. I have absolutely no idea. I am not a big royal uh, family follower. I don't understand the obsession at all. Uh, so I could not tell you. Uh, let me just try to think. I can work it out. Uh, who was Elizabeth's mother? Do you know? No, are you sure it was Victoria? Wasn't Victoria before that? That's what I'm saying. I don't know. The one before Queen Elizabeth? 
they were the royals. George, King George, yes, well done, VMP. King George and his wife. <laughs> so, strange enough, when it comes to the royals and stuff like that, I know more about sort of, uh, well, Victoria, because she had a, a huge hand in shaping the history and or the future and, and uh, of Africa. Hello, Lily, who's seven years old. Lily, I'm afraid it is not the Maasai Mara. Sorry, Lily. Try again. Lily, Lily, it begins with a T. Here we go. So, uh, we are, as I said, we are hoping to find find uh, any form of heartbeat at the moment. Uh, Safari Heart and many others, you are correct. It is Savo National Park, which com it com uh, compromises of both Sa Savo East and West. It is by far the biggest park in Kenya. Very beautiful park. I've been there. I had a thoroughly wonderful time there. Saw some elephants, saw some jeronek, saw a leopard. Uh, the day before we arrived, my friends saw wild dogs. So uh, it is it is a, a magnificent place. We went to visit the Man Eaters of Savo Bridge, the, the, the railway bridge where the lions ate those human beings uh, back when they were building the suicide line. The suicide line is the train line that ran from Mombasa all the way to uh, Lake Victoria. Now, let us think. We're going to start off with a, a tough one. I think you guys are getting these answers too easily. Oh, I've got one. What? animal is the national park's emblem for Gabon. Ha! That should keep you guys guessing for a bit. What animal is the national park's emblem for Gabon? It's quite a cool emblem actually. It's, it's always fun when you're in French Africa because you're in the national park. Parc du National. Just the way it's written. Kirsten McLennan Smith, it is not a platypus because the platypus is Australian. There are, there are no platypuses in Africa, and you know that. You are just being ridiculous in my ear. So we're at that awkward stage where Spotlight doesn't quite do the job. <laughs> Jazz says people are Googling. I know. You to, how can you look at yourselves in the computer screen while you do that? Cheats. Cheats. Don't see me googling, do you? I'm getting ready for the spotlight, but as I say, it's still a bit, a little bit on the, on the, on the too light side for the spotlight just yet. But I just want to make sure it's all untangled. Now I'm sure Jamesy must be nearly home because he definitely doesn't want to be out in the dark with this wind howling about. No, I don't want to be out in the dark with this wind howling, everybody. So we're walking home as fast as we can, but the darkness is coming and I don't know if we're going to make it. We should be okay, don't worry. I'm just joking. We'll be fine. Good. Well, you know, I don't have anything of great biological significance to show you right now. So as I look, I shall tell you that in Shushuwe, which Brent was describing to you, is where I had my first, or one of my first, encounters on foot with animals. I was a soil science student, can you believe it? Yes, at one stage of my life I was studying soil science and the class was dispatched to Shushuwe to uh, take soil samples so that we could do a survey of the area and we found a a white rhino. It was absolutely amazing. I, we came across this thing and I quickly got myself to a, to a tree because, you know, I didn't know what to do in those days. And the girl I was seeing at the time also got herself to a tree 
and I was faced with a very real conundrum of should I climb over her and into the tree or should I help her up and possibly risk dying myself. I'm very pleased that I did not have to uh, make the decision basically because what happened was the guide we were with just went and the rhino turned around and walked away. So that was a very pleasing ending to a potentially dreadful conundrum that I had. It's a true story. What else? I, that's all I can tell you about Lechlue, I think. Yes, that's all I can tell you about Lechlue. Now, we're approaching quarantine clearings. And I wonder if we won't find the last... Hmm, <laughs> I was thinking of something entertaining to say about quarantine there and thinking about the uh, a leopard in the last light is what I was trying to say when Saskia's question came through and it was added to by Kirsten she says what is the oldest thing at Juma in evolutionary terms in other words what has you taken what has not evolved for the greatest amount of time and then Kirsten added other than you which I thought was very unkind Saskia, I would say it's probably the impala. No, it's probably one of the reptiles. Mammal-wise, it is definitely one of the impala. It's definitely the impala. They seem to be one of the oldest, and um, I can never remember the exact number, but they are much older than just about any other species here. Reptile-wise, crocodiles are much younger than we thought they were, so it could be the leopard tortoise or perhaps the speaks hinge tortoise. Tree-wise, I've got absolutely no idea. I think you might find, I, I don't think the trees would necessarily be any older than the, than the mammals because both of their existence or ability to exist is driven by environmental conditions and climate. So I think you'll probably find that the suites of species that are around here um, are, you know, they almost go hand in hand, if you know what I mean. But, of course, the more adaptable a species is, the much more, or the more likely it is to survive uh, catastrophic climatic events like ice ages and that sort of thing in volcanoes. And somehow, impala, probably because they can mixed feed, have and because they have that amazing breeding, synchronised breeding system, I guess they, that's why they've lasted for as long as they have. The thing about it is, though, that if you are a specialist, a complete specialist, you can often do very well in specific conditions, but as soon as one variable changes, perhaps there's a disease that wipes out a specific kind of grass or a specific tree, your ability to survive is immediately hampered. Whereas if you are an impala, and they're numerous in the Kruger, but they're certainly not numerous uh, on the scale of wildebeest up in East Africa, for example. But if you are a generalist like they are, or like leopards, you're going to survive and spread far further than any of the specialists which might at some times occur in much greater numbers and then go extinct uh, as a result of a very minor change in the ecology where you'd find them. It's a very interesting discussion, Saskia. Thank you for bringing it up. I'm most pleased and so grateful. Let's have a last look at these antelope in the dark. There they are. Marvellous. Now, if ever, of course, anyone was looking for a new host for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, I believe that Quizmaster Brent would be their best possible choice. Ha 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 Funny, funny, Jamesy. Now, I've got a, a, an easier one coming through. I'm going to stick with it. I quite like this, this, this this topic and but of course before I launch into another question <laughs> Norman it is not a red pig or a red river hog but that's a very good guess because that is uh, one of the creatures Zach there are, as far as, though there's no flamingos, I didn't see any flamingos in Gabon. Did they occur in Gabon? No, I don't think they occur in Gabon. Not a flamingo, Zach. 
Ravinda again, two very good guesses, but no, not a gorilla or a chimpanzee. That uh, the gorilla is the gorilla is the emblem of uh, the Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda. It is a gorilla. Wild Allen says a black panther. Nope, not black panther. It is an iconic forest species. Ah, uh, I was waiting for that. Liz, good guess, but no, not a forest elephant. Ha ha! Ha ha! I have caught you. If no one gets it. <laughs> Piat, it is not a rock hyrax. You don't get rock hyraxes there. You only get tree hyraxes in the rainforest. It is... I'm going to see. Wait, one more before I give a, a big hint. Kia, it is not a baboon either. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It is related, and was in the same family, as the kudu. Aha, uh -huh. that's a big hint. Ah, it is not an eland, Zach. There are no eland in Gabon. To the north of the Gabon, however, you do get the Lord Derby's eland in the Central African Republic. Aha! Bill, Anyala, it is not, but again, it is a cousin. A distant cousin of the Anyala. Now, Bill, Anyala only occur in South, South Africa and Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And there we go. Ah, Lara Moa, indeedy, it is a bongo. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest antelopes around. A big male bongo can weigh over 400 kilograms. <gasps> Very heavy. But it is a bongo indeed. Now, an easier one? Maybe not so. I like this game. I've got another one here. It's what animal is the emblem for South African National Park? Easy, easy, easy. That's going to be quick. Uh, Kirsten is still on about the platypus. Kirsten, you are a platypus. Vimpio, our light is on as well. There we go. Uh, we are hoping that Ishdul might be somewhere around here. We're heading towards the gate at the moment. Or, who knows, a random lion might just pop up. Cody, I am so sad you've never heard of a bongo. I think you should Google bongo and have a look. It is an absolutely gorgeous antelope. Now, you have two types of bongo. You have uh, the western bongo which is the more common that occurs central african republic cameroon congo uh both congos uh, and then the eastern bongo which is much more rare and that occurs in kenya strange enough in the abadares and uh very very rare though uh, surviving in remnant forest up in the mountains of kenya Lily! Good guess, Lily. Who's seven years old, Lily? It is not a lion. It's another antelope. Well, I wonder, you are spot on indeed. It is a kudu. Uh, or, more specifically, a set of kudu horns is the emblem for the South African National Parks Service. I'm sure there was a lot of correct answers on that one. So, after the easy one, let's hit you with the difficult one. Hmm. hmm. Sounds like all it says you guys are having fun. I'm having a huge amount of fun as well. Should we let Vim do one? Vim, do you want to do one? No. Okay. Um, 
What national park is on the edge of a salt pan that is the same size as the country of Switzerland? What national park is on a salt pan or that is the side of Switzerland? Ah, I think that's a good one. What do you think, Vim? I think that could keep some brains turning for a bit. Coast Sida. What is the largest continuous reserve in Southern Africa? Um, it is probably uh, the Kalahari, not the Kala, uh, the Central Kalahari. It's, no, actually Kruger is bigger than Central Kalahari. Probably Kruger in Southern Africa. Uh, yeah, I would probably say it's Kruger. Chobe is about a million. Central Kalahari is 1.2 million. Kruger's 2.4, and that's not including all the private reserves and transfrontier parks. Uh, if you go north into Zambia, the Kafui, Kafui is much bigger uh, than Kruger, probably about double the size. Uh, so <laughs> I guess yeah, it's Kruger if you work it out. Natasha's no, Natasha's not nearly the same size as Kruger. I think skeleton, skeleton. Skeleton Coast, maybe, Vim? What do you think? Oh. What's that, Vim? It's long and narrow. It's, it's long and narrow, yeah, but I'm just trying to think. It's a, it's a difficult one. So apparently, Rolf has got a flat tyre, so you're stuck with a Vim PNI. Vim, left or right? Uh, left. left. Vim wants to go left. Vim wants to check the boundary for Shidulu. Oh, well done. Punk and rock music. That's the type of music I like to listen to, punk and rock music, and you've got it right. It's indeed the Mkhadi Khadi Pans National Park. It is in central Botswana. Uh, the Mkhadi Khadi Pan is the remnant of an old super lake that the Zambezi River used to flow into, as well as the Okavango and Kwondo and Chobe rivers. And uh, that super lake used to flow out to sea down the Limpopo River, which is on the northern boundary of South Africa. The Limpopo is a relatively dry river, a sand river for most of, most of, it, most of the time now, but about 30 to 40,000 years ago, uh, it was a massive flowing river, and it used to go out to sea in Mozambique. Of course, the Zambezi still goes out to sea in Mozambique, just a lot further north now. There was a tectonic plate movements which caused the Zambezi to change its direction and that super lake to dry. Oh, Sid, 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 Sid's got a quiz for me. Sid, you're going to have to try a bit harder than that. Sid's question is which capital city in Africa has a national park next to it. Da -da 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 I know the answer, so let's see if you guys can get it. So, before I give it away, have a, have a crack at Sid's quiz. See if you can tell which national park in Af uh, which national park sits right on the edge of the capital city. Some, I've seen some incredible photographs. Uh, there's incredible photographs of it uh, with lions and the city sort of sky behind the, the, the tall buildings from downtown. <coughs> Not going to say it just yet. Leah, it is not Chobe National Park. Uh, Chobe National Park has the very small village of Kasani next to it. No, no, not capital city. Capital of Botswana is Khabarone, and it's way down on the south near the border with South Africa.
Carol, unless you are correct, it is Nairobi National Park in Kenya. And you actually, as you land, you drive past it. It's right near the airport as well, Nairobi National Park. Got pretty much everything, rhinos, lions, leopards, hyenas, just no elephants. Now I'm trying to think of some good questions now. Okay, this, this, this one's a... Well, actually, there's another national park that is um, next to a capital city. It's Table, Table Mountain National Park. I forgot about that. It's Cape Town is one of uh, South Africa's capitals. South Africa has three capitals. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, it's unusual, yes, but that's no point. We like to be different. When the world is full of normal. Uh, it has three capitals. Uh, we have uh, Pretoria, which is the administrative. Uh, Cape Town is the parliamentary, and Bloemfontein is the judicial. So I suppose you could say it is one of the capital cities of South Africa, and Table Mountain National Park is right next to it. So there we are. That's two that I can think of. I'm just trying to think now if I can think of a, another one that's got a national park right next to it. But, well, I think I've spotted some eyes. See them there, Vim? I'm not sure what it is. I can just see some eyes here. Probably a dike or a stand book. We're just double checking. What do you think, Vimpy? Yeah, they're still there between those two little sticks. Oh, it's, a, it's a diker. Okay, it's a little diker, and we're not going to keep. Um, so, Stuart, the most inaccessible national park in Africa. Oof. <laughs> Anyone in uh, the... Uh, <laughs> in Somalia <laughs> at the moment. Uh, generally, when it comes to that stuff, also another very inaccessible national park, Salanga in DRC Congo. Uh, what else? Very inaccessible. Uh, most of the national parks in Central African Republic at the moment, most of, the, most of that inaccessibility is due to, to problems. Uh, well, political uprising, uh, civil war, that type of stuff. Well, I had to change a tyre before drive, and Ralph had to change his tyre during drive, but it seems like he is up and about again. Yes, well, everyone, um, you know that little word called karma, uh, because I was laughing at Brent when he was changing his tyre earlier, and, well, it caught up with me quite quickly then, didn't it? So, um, yeah, that little escapade that we had where we found those elephants and that obviously landed us with a puncture. So we just quickly had to... Oh, there's some eyes. We quickly had to change. There's green eyes as well. What are you in the bushes there? What are you? That looks like an antelope, looks like maybe a nyala. So, yes, we had to change that. Now, it seems like uh, uh, Brent is the quiz king. So there's a little question that I'd like to ask all of you, but I'd also like to see if Brent knows the answer. And that is, um, what is the country, and you're going to be surprised with the answer, or with the answer. What is the country in the world with the highest low point. So in other words, the lowest point in that country is the highest out of all the country's low points in the world. So the country with the highest low point on the planet, which country is that? And now don't Google it. Come on guys, let's see your answers. Let's have all the guesses and let's see what Brent says. 
And uh, Kirsten, I'm going to be asking you to check that Brent doesn't Google it. We want honest answers while we look for some night nice animals here. Where are our little bush babies? Now some of you, um, there are some animals that never sleep. I would say like uh, impala, they, they, they rest but they never sleep. Um, similar with giraffe, also very nervous. Um, they pretty much never sleep as well. There's a little bit of resting going on but they are so nervous that they don't sleep and uh, what's an animal that doesn't have any eyelids that's a, that's an animal that will never sleep and that's fish fish don't have any eyelids so they can't even close their eyes but um, I think there are some sharks that do uh, sort of rest as well where it seems like they're pretty much asleep but um, they don't have any eyelids so they can't close their eye so they'd have to be sleeping with their eyes open. And the kinds of fish that we get here in these little pans, mostly tilapia. Uh, is, there's a couple of different species of tilapia, uh, but we also call them locally kerpa, kerpa in Afrikaans. Uh, we also have the catfish, the sharp tooth catfish, which is probably the most prolific of the lot. Uh, naturally occurring, there should also be some little silver fish and yellow fish and um, and then there's, in the Kruger Park area, there's a very special fish that is called the Bryant lungfish. But it's only found, it's endemic to South Africa, and only found in a specific part of the Kruger National Park. And a very specific little fish that is, it's actually got lungs, which is um, very unusual for a fish. So it can't stay underwater, it actually has to come up and breathe. And um, you don't find them anywhere else in the world which is quite fascinating. But other animals that never sleep, I'm trying to think. All right, are there any answers that we've got for the quiz? Britain, no, you are incorrect. It is not. Let's just have a look. I don't know if he's disappeared. There he is. Uh, and we can go to IR infrared so that we don't disturb him. He might come back out on the road. I'll just keep the spot until we do. There we are. Brent and Pangolin, that is a very common answer and you would think that Nepal is the country with the highest low point but it is incorrect. Incorrect as we look at this little cape scrub here. I think we're going to move on a little bit. See what other animals we can find in the darkness. I'm looking for a bush baby. I haven't seen one in a long time. I saw one the other evening, but very fleetingly. So Nepal is not the correct answer. It is not the country with the highest low point in the world. You will be surprised. Dirk, it is not Peru. Not Peru. We're pretty much, I'm sure we're going to go through all the countries with mountains in them, but that's all right. That's all right. Come on, where's our bush babies or a chameleon? We'll look for a chameleon as well. There's some eyes there, but probably impala. Don't shine on the impala. Any of the diurnal animals, it's, it pretty much stuns them. So. Ashley, you have hit the nail on the head. It is indeed Lesotho, the country with the li ho uh, highest low point in the world. So a little bit closer to home than anybody would think. And uh, everywhere in Lesotho is above a thousand meters. Whereas in Nepal, there are places that are below a thousand meters. So very interesting, huh? So Brent, ooh, another scrub here. Ah, Brent has found what I've been looking for. Off to him. There you go. Hello, little chameleon sitting on the edge of the, the branch. As you can see, we are looking at it in infrared. Well, not very far from where I spotted a chameleon the other night. 
just on the other side of the road, in fact. And you can see how those eyes can work independently of each other. Giving them incredible vision. Or peripheral vision. There we go. See the wind still blowing. Shame that the chameleon. We don't like keeping the lights on them for too long. Well, uh, lights off now, but when we found them, I think the light probably woke him up when we spotted him as we were walking, uh, when we were driving past. I spotted him in the spotlight. They are such cool creatures, chameleons. Now, since we've got chameleons here, a chameleon, should I say, I've got a question. Which country has the most chameleon species in the world? Hashtag Safari Live if you know the answer. Which country has the most chameleon species in the world? It's really quiet tonight. There's a few insects out. Oh, look, there's a spider. There's a spider. Is it a spider or an ant? It's an ant. Look at that. It looks like a polyrhynchus ant. Now, chameleons don't have the best night vision, so I'm wondering if he's going to be able to eat it. Well, he might not eat it. Those ants often have nasty stuff inside it. <laughs> that was very cool. I love watching their eyes. Here comes another ant. That's fascinating. The ant seems a bit confused about what is this? This isn't a branch. This isn't a leaf. Oh, off the ant goes. How cool is that? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, Anne says we found the 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 latest, the newest, the new Safari Live show. It's sorry, Aaron. Aaron, sorry, I misheard there. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, and it's a quiz with Brent. Let's start a Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> yes, that would be quite fun. A little Safari quiz show. Ah, oh, it sounds like it was too easy for everyone. Everyone, uh, Thomas was the first, apparently, but lots of people got it. You are spot on, correct? Madagascar. Okay, okay, Madagascar. What country in the world has the second most chameleon species? Ha! See, that one's going to be a bit tougher. Hashtag Safari Live, if you know the answer. Hello, Tula Ann, who's five years old. Tula Ann, I have not been to any of the national parks in the USA yet, but I really want to. Uh, the closest I came was I, I, I went out into the Puget Sound uh, of Seattle. I saw some seals, I saw, uh, and I saw a black bear cross the road in front of me when I was on my way to a meeting, but I have unfortunately not. Uh, Yellowstone, definitely high up on spots I want to go um, uh, anywhere in the Rockies really and um, Wyoming and Montana I'm a big fly fisherman so Montana I would definitely like to get to um, oh no I li I've driven through one of the the, the national parks um, in the States but I was on a highway I went uh, down Alligator Alley in Florida through the Everglades National Park and I saw me a few alligators I did. Uh, the guy I was traveling with um, from, from New York, he was getting quite annoyed. He was like, alligator, alligator, stop, 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 stop. And he wouldn't, no, we're not stopping. We're going to be late for a meeting. Yes, but uh, Alligator Alley. I suppose it doesn't really count. I didn't go to it. I just drove through it. Gala, it is not South America. It is not South America. It is in Africa. 
the country that has the second most chameleon species in the world? Kia, it is not South Africa. We actually don't have uh, a very diverse chameleon family. We've got obviously the flat necked over most. And then in the, I know James was chatting about the, the, the Cape Floral Kingdom. There's some dwarf chameleon species in and around there. But uh, no, we don't actually have that many chameleon species. I don't think we even have 10 different ones. Now, strange enough, in my travels, I, Christine, it is not Zimbabwe. Uh, strange enough, in my travels, I'm, I'm not going to give it away too much, uh, I met some Harvard students uh, who were studying those, those chameleons and actually had uh, a collection. They had collected uh, uh, specimens. And uh, I mean, these guys had uh, five or six hundred uh, preserved chameleons that they were busy getting ready to ship back to the States for further study. So it's a country with quite a few remnant spots of forests and stuff like that. So you've got quite a lot of speciation happening on mountains that are quite close to each other but they're they're isolated so what started off as the same species there now has turned into three or four or five different species it's very very interesting same's happened with the snakes um, and and the birds well you try to figure out what it is uh, let's go across to Ralph to see what he's up to next Well, we're pretty much just driving around looking for any kind of nightlife. Maybe there's a little art fark walking around or a little genet. But I can tell you what, on a night like this, it would be very difficult to navigate. If I didn't have Davi on board or a trusty GPS or something to find our way organically like that, um, I would be totally lost. I'd have to drive around until I find something that I... Um, recognized because it is there's you cannot oh there's one star poking out but you can't see enough stars there's no southern cross there's nothing else to see that you would be able to work out which direction we're going and you could turn around in circles all night I think what you'd have to do if you didn't have any of those and, I, and if I was alone I would just drive in one direction uh, for as long as possible and try and f get to a fence or or a building or just go towards a light something like that but uh, really this is the kind of evening you get horribly lost on a game reserve and something that happened to me when I was on Salati game reserve which is not too far from here it's 22,000 hectares so um, it's probably about 20 times the size of Juma but um, I was driving around I was still new to the reserve and uh, it landed up a, quite a night like this where it was quite overcast and I was driving a group of students around we were doing a night drive and I thought I knew exactly where I was until I um, I wanted to come back then I started driving back and I and I thought you know I need to turn right here so I turned right and then when I got to a junction it didn't look familiar so I went right again and then I thought no okay got to another junction and then I thought no I need to correct myself I turned left I don't know where I landed up, but it took us about three hours to get back. Um, eventually, we found a riverbed that uh, we stayed on the opposite side of, so we landed up following that. But we, we must have driven about 25 to 30 kilometers out of, uh, away from where we were supposed to be. It was incredible. And um, I've also had it at night where I've been walking, and I've had to... Uh, well, we, we went for an overnight sleep out uh, in the Kruger National Park up in Makuleki and one of the girls fell horribly ill um, in the middle of the night and uh, we had to call a camp to come and get close to us to the closest road which was only about 200, 250 meters away from us. However, there had been lions calling near to us. We had, we had walked past a massive herd of buffalo on the way to our spot where we were sleeping on the side of a small hill overlooking a little pan and um, so anyway eventually the, the the rescue car came to that spot about 250 meters away from us and we could we could hear their voices but once we went down into the little valley that that where the pan was we sort of lost um, 
audio of their voices. And in the dark, we were very worried, obviously, about uh, big wild animals such as elephants and lions. So we had our strong torches with us. And, um, well, we walked and walked and walked very slowly with, a, you know, some uh, other guys with us just for more eyes. And um, we landed up that we heard some voices and we thought, well, there they are. And we walked up. And after about 45 minutes, we realized we were back at camp. So we had to start all over again. And the guys at the vehicle were, were really worrying about us because they couldn't understand why we weren't getting to them. So it landed up taking us an hour and a half to walk 250 meters. But it was in the dark, pitch black. We only had torches and uh, it was uh, quite scary. I tell you, I got back to camp and uh, that little 200 meters totally exhausted me and we had walked I think it was about 20 kilometers that day but uh, the worst was that 250 meters I was totally exhausted I passed out that night luckily we had our night watchmen uh, that were looking out over us the whole night so I could sleep at least a little bit oopsie and in the morning we then headed back to camp and we then looked at the 250 meters that we had walked around in circles um, and Darby just pointing me in the right direction here. Yeah, you see, I would have gone left there. Sorry, there's a hole. And I would have got us nicely lost again. Where are you, Jennets? Oh, there's a scrub here. Another one. Okay, I think we're going to try and find any kind of night animal except a scrub here. We've seen enough of them. Not that I'm discriminating, but we'd like to see something else. Let's head on over to Brent and see if he's been able to find anything, but also his quiz answers. I haven't. I'm hoping for some bush babies along Zoe's Road. I often see them here, but alas, no luck just yet. Now we're getting closer, Barbara and Liz, but it is neither Mozambique nor is it Kenya. But we are getting closer. Could be somewhere in between. It is, it's in between Kenya and Mozambique. It is Tanzania. Well done, W. Jane. There we go. It is Tanzania. And most of that is due to the Eastern Arc Mountains, the Ulungurus the Mbarikas, the Odudzungwas, and there you've got incredible speciation that is being studied. From the birds to the, the, the reptiles, and uh, incredible speciation. Okay. Hello, Helmet! Helmet! Indeed, there are ancient ruins in the Kruger National Park. Uh, they are right up in the north of the park. Um, I'm just trying to remember what their proper name is now. I'll remember in a second. But yes, so on the Levuvu River, in the Pufuri area of the park, there is an ancient walled city uh, that was more than likely, it's all from the same era of the, the, the walled cities of Mapingubwe and Great Zimbabwe. Um, a trade outpost uh, on the river meeting the traders, uh, specifically the Arab traders, that would have been coming up the Limpopo River uh, in, from the coast of Mozambique. So yes, there, is an, there are ancient ruins in the Kruger up in the north. And uh, very, very, very beautiful. I've been there. It's uh, surrounded by baobabs. It is absolutely spectacular, and the name of that city is going to make me go mad because I cannot remember it. But yes, part of the same as the Mapungubwe complex. Now, Mapungubwe uh, is further up the Limpopo River, which was one of the great trade routes. Now, there is an interesting tree that you will find on the Limpopo River in southern Africa, and most of the major rivers coming in from East Africa. And uh, they, uh, these trees have become naturalized in, in Africa. They are not from Africa. And uh, they were eaten by the 
the Arab traders on their, their caravans and stuff as they moved in either trading for ivory, gold or slaves. And uh, I used to eat them quite a lot. I had quite a big one outside my room in Tanzania. Lovely, sweet and sticky, the tamarind tree. So there's tamarind trees in that part of Kruger where there are no tamarind trees further south. There, there were some sort of forries down further to the to the the east coast of Africa in terms of trading but the problem is the the active coastline that the the east coast of South Africa has uh, would have made it almost impossible for safe anchorages and harbors uh, for the, the the trading dows so that's why they didn't really come further down than Mozambique and uh, you will also notice from a historical point of view you have very uh, in terms of the, the, the tribes of South Africa, you have no ocean-going tribes and, and who used to use and utilize the sea. But you move slightly north into, Mo into Mozambique and the tribes there have been utilizing the sea for thousands of years. And that is basically just due to how active the South African coastline is. You get very big waves uh, and uh, very big tides and, and, and it makes it would have made it very difficult for primitive people to, to utilize the sea from a boat point of view. However, just a little bit north, um, the sea is much, much calmer. So uh, with quite a lot of these big uh, sort of uh, harbors in terms of natural harbors, in terms of river mouths and things like that. So you have a lot more of an ocean culture uh, further, further up the coast than you do down in South Africa where we have that a really rough uh, rough tides, a rough coastline, big waves. Oh, I've always find that type of stuff fascinating. Now, of course, Mapungubwe uh, is most famous for the golden rhino that they found there. Now, at the, this is still going to drive me absolutely nuts that I can't remember the name of this other city. I normally never forget stuff like that. Oh, it'll come to me, I hope. Um, Oh, man, it's just, sorry, it's just really, really driving me nuts. But it is. I always find it fascinating if you if you look at that type of stuff, and uh, uh, really, really interesting. Also, there wasn't a need. Thank you, three forty dream. Tulamela is the name of the Kruger ruins. Thank you very much. It was literally going to make me go absolutely bonkers before the end of drive. Uh, Tulamela is the correct name for the Kruger ruins. Yes, I've been there. It's, it's beautiful, right on on a hill above the 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 Luvuvu River. I actually saw a leopard on my way there. Okay, well. Thank you for that. I'm going to keep searching for a bush baby or three. In the meantime, let's see if Rolf's had any luck with any nocturnal critters. Not just yet, Brent. We're, um, we've had uh, lots of little scrub hairs. There's another one, but nothing else. And you know, I was just chatting with Darby as well. Um, Saskia, there are lots of bats in Juma, uh, insectivorous bats, but uh, they do migrate as well, so we don't really see them in winter, um, and we also have lots of fruit bats as well. So the insectivorous bats are normally the little micro chiroptera that we call them, small little bats, tiny little things, they've got ferocious little jaws that they attack um, the insects as they as they fly through and quite interesting is that we used to have some uh, insectivorous bats living in our thatch in uh, um, on the one of the camps that I used to work at where we were training the students and uh, these bats used to obviously live up inside the rafters inside the thatch and underneath was our table where we used to have dinner and we also used to do all our studies and so on and the lectures etc and um, the little bats obviously used to go out hunting every night and in the morning, we used to see all sorts of casings and legs of all sorts of whatever they'd been eating during the night. And it was fascinating, the kinds of um, things that they used to be feeding on, obviously. And a lot of spiders. They used to uh, be eating golden orbweb spiders. So that's quite incredible. And one of the instructors actually saw that the, the, the bats weren't uh, catching the spider and flying through the web. They were actually flying up to the web and 
grabbing the spider out of it. So it wasn't like a straight through and, and catch it on its way through. And then obviously go up into the rafters and eat the body of the spider and drop off the legs. Another one that was, oopsie, another one that was fascinating was um, baboon spider legs. Because as you know, baboon spiders, and there's a little baby scrubby. Baboon spiders, they live on the ground. And, uh, and let's just see the little baby there. And so the bats would have had to be picking it up off the ground as well. So from flying and, and grabbing a, a golden orb web spider out of the nest to swooping um, baboon spiders off the ground. Oh, this little one is just running away from mommy, which I don't particularly want it to do. Okay, so everybody, tomorrow morning there is going to be a slight time change because we're going into winter. So just a reminder to everybody that it's going to be happening half an hour later than usual. Um, the morning or sunrise uh, safari there are scrub hairs everywhere. Um, so the sunrise safari will be starting at 6.30 Central African time or our local time in South Africa and um, finishing at 9.30 and then the afternoon show will start half an hour earlier. So instead of at 3.30 it will start at 3. So there you go. Get ready for earlier action. So we get to sleep an hour longer in the evening, but we have our safaris closer together. So we don't get to go out in the middle of the day and find as many tracks as we normally do. We'll have to just work harder on the drives. Now, where are you bush babies? or genets, or art fark, or leopard. I want to see the unusual things at this time of night. But like I was saying to Davi, um, it is a little bit early in the year. When we, when we go off into winter, the animals are going to be active a little bit earlier in the evenings because of the difference in temperature. So while we continue looking out for these little critters, let's um, Let's head on over to Brent and see how his search is going. Well, we've got one last quiz for you. Now, the last quiz of the day. I hope everyone is ready, just so no one gets confused. The quiz is, what time does Safari Live start from tomorrow on the sunrise and sunset safari? Because remember, tomorrow is the winter time change. So the last quiz, what time tomorrow? does the safari start in the morning and in the afternoon now this yes there are lots of marine reserves in Africa um, all over Africa South Africa East Africa um, Central Gabon Congo there are a lot of marine reserves uh, in in Africa we've got marine reserves all over the place okay, let's just... I was hoping to find a snake tonight sometimes after a cold day you can find them sitting up in these different things well done, Ravinda. Well done. This is 6.30. So, yes, that is correct, 6.30. Now, remember that from tomorrow we will be going out half an hour later in the morning. So, we will be going out at 6.30, not 6 a.m. Central African time. And in the afternoon we'll be going out half an hour earlier, which means we'll be going out at 3 p.m. Central African time. So we'll be starting at 3 p.m. Central African time in, on the Sunset Safari and 6.30 a.m. Central African time on the Sunrise Safari. <laughs> ah, now we've got the jokesters coming out. Origin says when the sun rises. Indeed, yes. Uh, 
The sun rises every morning, Origin. Well, if it didn't, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But it has been... Uh, it's been lots of fun. I've really enjoyed the quiz game this, this afternoon. For, unfortunately, the animals weren't as as uh, forthcoming as we would have liked. So we didn't get to see any of our favorite cat characters, but I'm sure we'll catch up with them in the week. And the wild dogs continue to elude me. But I've got, I've got a feeling this is the week that I'm going to get to play with some puppies. So fingers crossed. Maybe it'll be tomorrow morning on Sunrise Safari. That would be wonderful. Now, it's going to be an absolute blast. It's quite chilly. I'm ready for my dinner and uh, another early night so I can get out at 6.30 tomorrow morning to take you on a safari here in Africa. And who knows, maybe Pandi and Kalamba will be about, or the dogs. But from all of us here at Safari Live, bon nuit, adieu, good night, till tomorrow.